Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the Geologist, his non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. Welcome to game nine in this uh, special challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Grandelius. Uh, they're playing in the heart of London at the Swedish Embassy. And after yesterday's win for David, uh, Nils really has to, to strike back with the white pieces today. And uh, I'm really happy that I'm joined by the one and only Grandmaster Stuart Conquest. Welcome, Stuart. Askil, thank you very, very much for that uh, kind introduction. You're also one and only, come on. <laughs> And uh, we've had a couple of moves, so uh, let's see. Uh, Perfect. Hey, great to see you yesterday, and David as well, and Niels, just to pass by and see you all. It was fantastic. Yeah, what uh, what uh, coincidence to, to see you here at uh, the chess shop in London. That was, yeah, um, that was great. On Baker Street, yeah. yeah. So we had dinner last night, I killed, with, with David, uh, okay. and um, we were sort of joking a bit, but talking about uh, the possible openings for today, whether he would play his normal e5 e4 e5 and he has absolutely and um, the question now i guess will we see another italian game yeah yeah it looks like uh i mean nils won the the previous game with white in this very sharp uh italian game and um I that mean, was the game with this amazing rook a3 idea correct yeah it was only almost like a morphe morphe-esque uh game sacrificing and uh yeah, brilliant game by, by Nils. And I mean, I did get the impression yesterday, Stuart, that David, he, he wasn't full of confidence uh, going into today's game with the black pieces, knowing that he, he lost, you know, uh, the previous game. Um, well, so. but you know, he's also maybe being a little bit modest. I'm sure he was uh, delighted to have won. I mean, he won a great game. Yeah, absolutely. He won a great game. So only two games of the match to go. So if he draws today, he's in a very strong position now. Yeah? Absolutely. And and now the question is, will he play knight f6 or bishop c5? Okay. It because looks like he's gone for bishop c5. Because in, in one of the other games in this match, he played the knight f6. And then we okay. got uh, some other sharp variations, I think. Uh, but uh, in the game he lost, uh, he actually played uh, yeah, bishop c5. Um, right. And we're we expecting the Evans Gambit. That's good. <laughs> That's B4, right? Correct. Yeah, B4. And if you take, you get a lot of... Um... You do. Yeah, where, do you, where do you go with the bishop? A5? Uh, normally A5 or even to E7. Bishop E7 is also possible. Lots um, of fun uh, with D4, Queen B3, castles, etc. Yeah. yeah. Romantic, romantic chess. Absolutely. I mean... Do top players play that opening uh, still, or is it more for, for Blitz? And, and well, I mean, th there was a period when Gary Kasparov was playing the Evans Gambit um, yeah. in the 1980s, and Nigel Short uh, certainly played it many, many times with success as well, I have to say. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's a surprise weapon. It's still, uh, it's still, uh, it's still out there, you know? But um, Nils uh, goes for the more uh, solid setup with uh, Castle, and then David quickly replies with uh, with knight f6. 
Correct. Yeah. Um, he was joking to us last night, wasn't he, Oscar? That he that one defense he'd been thinking of maybe playing in this match was Alakan's defense. Uh, yeah, absolutely. E4, right. um, but I think he's played e4, e5 in all his black games. Is that correct? Yeah, correct. And uh, I remember many, many years ago, I went to Benidorm for a tournament with, um, yeah, Udin and um, some Norwegian chess uh, friends and, and Simon Nag this time. Simon went to, to the chess school outside of Oslo. And then um, Simon had set up um, a class with uh, Mikhail Suba, mm. who at the time was uh, very into the, you know, the Alekhain opening. So he showed right. us some, some brilliant games with, with the Alekhain opening. And the next day in the tournament, I felt, you know, inspired to try out this uh, interesting opening. And then I, I lost, you know, in 15, 20 moves. Horribly. <laughs> I got some credit from Sim, and at least that I, you know, yeah, I was inspired, and uh, I, I don't think I've ever play, played it in a classical game since. But uh, I have tried it in a few Blitz games, and it is a, yeah, it's a fun, fun opening to, to yeah, play. It's nice to, it's nice to play different things um, now and again. Also, you learn a bit about different opening setups, um, and um, you know, sure, I'm not surprised. I have to say that David has stuck to his guns. He's played e5. He's happy to defend, let's say, an Italian game um something uh relatively solid although in this match i skill i mean i haven't been following from the start uh you know closely but i th I, th I think the white has been doing well basically in every game um, absolutely uh it started off uh with uh with mills having a very promising position in game one uh and he had a clear advantage i believe after only 10 10 12 moves and uh but uh, but also both players with the black pieces has been able to to fight back. Uh, so it's been really interesting games uh, fighting chess, and uh, yeah. So so I mean the score could have been differently if if both players had had uh, capitalized on their on right. their advantage uh, along the way. Right. So so just remind me and also for viewers the the, the time control skill is a classical time control. Yeah, so the first five games, they had a bit longer uh, classical time control. They started with two hours uh, for 40 moves and uh, also 30 second increments. Um, from game six on, they uh, they slashed uh, the time a little bit. So they started with 90 minutes for the first 40 moves. Interesting. And we have, we have had the shorter games last few days. Okay. Uh, in, in the beginning of the match, I think we had two games in a row that lasted close to uh seven hours so right. that was a bit uh, tiring both both for the commentators and the players but now last couple of days i think they've been playing for i don't know three and a half to four hours uh so it's um it's a bit shorter and uh i mean the players must must be feeling tired as well after oh. intense games and uh have they had any free days was it just one free day yeah they had one rest day on on monday so um so i was like um I was like a, a diplomat. So I started off the free day having lunch with Nils and walking mm. around at King's Cross with him. And then later in the day, I met David and uh, he took me sightseeing in the city center. So we went to the palace and uh, Big Ben and uh, yeah, all, all the all the famous uh, sites. Yeah. yeah. And how's it feel being in London? You're having a good time in general. You like being in London? Yeah. Uh, first time uh, back in London since 2018. Um, I, I went there just before the World Championship match, uh, actually, mm. uh, October 2018. Yeah, and it's it's a great city, and uh, hopefully I get to to explore a bit more uh, this weekend uh, after the match is over. And I might even go to a musical on Saturday night with with David. Uh, the Mamma Mia. Depending what time the game. Oh, Mamma Mia! Great, yeah, great yeah. choice. Yeah. <laughs> and surprisingly, the Nils is not such a big ABBA fan, uh, even though he's from Sweden. So. Uh, right. Mm. Controversial. Yeah, a bit controversial, but uh, both me and David uh, love uh, Abba. So that would so be. So do great. I. I might join you guys, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Feel free. So, um, yeah, I mean, what can we say about this opening? It seems quite, uh, quite normal. Um, sure. Solid, solid uh, it's, it's, so, I think I saw a couple of games, I just sort of looked quickly where Niels put his Queen's Knight on C3 in these kinds of positions um you know rather than play typically d3 and uh you know the italian move let's say Cerco piano um so white is very flexible yeah you'd expect d3 i guess but um 
But let's see. But also, I believe Nils played. Um, uh, he played uh, instead of uh, d3. He played uh, knight c3. Yes, that's what I was saying. Yes, mm -hmm. in one oh, game, no? In, yeah. Oh. I think that was the game he won a couple of days ago, hmm. and uh, with some idea of a4, and uh, David played a5, and then somehow Nils um, later in the game found this great idea. With yeah, that was amazing. The rook lift and. Uh, I mean, really something. he has been working, you know, with Magnus Carlsen in the past. And uh, some were speculating that uh, this Rook A3 idea was uh, was from one of the training camps with Magnus uh, some years ago. Right, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. In general, Niels is a well-prepared player, correct? I mean, with white and black. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, it must be a reason that Magnus Carlsen wants him uh, in his team and preparing for, for a World Championship match. So... Um, hmm. In, in addition to being a very nice, very nice guy, uh, obviously, but yeah, very well prepared and just a very solid, uh, solid player. But also, if you compare the styles, you know, between the players, maybe a bit more aggressive attacking player than, than David, which is perhaps a bit more um, positional player and, and trying to, to get a solid position and then take his chances once he, he gets them. I see Niels has played, it looks like he's played C3 there. Mm -hmm. And um, so the question is, can Black play D5? D7, D5 straight away? Yeah, I mean, that's what that's what White, uh, no, sorry, Black uh, often wants to do, right? Try and play D5. And, uh... and uh, of course, White will uh, take on D5, pawn takes D5, Knight will take back. And... Um... I don't think White would take on e5. He might play d4 himself, d2, d4. I'm not yeah. too familiar I think, with the theory. I think we looked at this with uh, Mihailo Oleksenko the other day. Oh, right, really? And there, are, there are some tricks in this position, but uh, I think we found out that after queen f6, uh, White just played d4. Right. And, uh, stops all the, all the threats uh, towards the, the White King. Um, but he, I think his conclusion was that it still was a bit dangerous for White to take on e5. So yeah, maybe okay. maybe d4 in this position hmm. uh, is a better option for hitting the, sure. the dark squared bishop and um, I guess takes. Pawn takes, yeah. Bishop, uh, bishop b6 or bishop b4, I don't know. Yeah. And then, you know, knight c3 or something. Um, yeah. I mean, this looks uh, yeah, this looks pleasant for for white, I would say. Um, sure. Uh, it but it's the position. Um, there must be lots of games in, in from this position or from a few moves ago, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. After Nielsen's move, C three, David is so has David been getting into time trouble in this match because he has a reputation. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean that's uh, uh, that's a good question. But, trouble uh, with clock, you know. I think he's been in, in time trouble in 90% uh, of the games, I would say. Right. Some, some sort of time trouble. And yes. unfortunately for him, uh, the game he lost, I mean, he was down to 30 seconds for the 10, 10 15 moves. And uh, there was a brilliant defense in, in that position, but he failed to, to, to see the best continuation. And uh, right. uh, I mean, sometimes uh, I've been saying this throughout the match that He's playing with fire a little bit, you know, because at some point the, the time trouble might uh, give him some some problems. And uh, yeah, well, of course. Um, but he knows that himself, you know. He knows yeah, that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he, he is a he is a, he has said himself that he is a time trouble addict. So yeah, I guess it's difficult not to not to go low on on the clock. Uh, mm. Yeah. So this looks like um, maybe something like this and. Uh, Guess you have to go bishop d4 perhaps. Yeah, it's almost looking like a Petrov, uh, similar to some some lines. Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. And then lots lots could happen. Uh, okay, but c3, I, I like that from Nils, and um, it's quite direct. Yeah. Um, I don't know if Black could even play knight takes e4 followed by d5. That's another possibility, perhaps, instead of d5 to play knight takes pawn. Does that work? Ah, and then um, then d5, yeah. Yeah, this is also... 
this just looks good for for black. It does. It does look good. Maybe maybe after white would play d4 here, I suppose. Yeah, he'd have of course d4. Yeah, so d4. And then I just don't know the theory here, or you know what uh, what one should do. The black has here, then. Okay. It is a bit. Uh... Maybe bishop takes f7 check. Otherwise, um, yeah. yeah, something like this. Mm. Looks wow. like black. Yeah, I mean, uh, but I was also surprised the other day because you know uh, the Italian uh, Italian opening is what I mean one of the first openings you, you play when you start playing chess, and mm. uh, I was I mean a bit surprised that there's so many interesting uh, positions that can occur. You know, yes. after only, only 10, 12 moves in in, mm. in that opening, and and a very tactical uh, opening as well. You have to watch out for tricks and. Uh, uh, and yet, you know what, Askel? If you went back to look at the time of uh, Paul Morphy and people like this, there's probably games from this position. It was probably a very standard opening position, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and also, I mean, uh, C three is is a very flexible move because sometimes I guess you want to go B four, A four. Sometimes you bring the queen out to, to b3. So, um, but also, I mean, it's, it's very logical to to try and go for the the center. That's one I, of the things. I mean, you... either David tries to punish this move, as I say, with knight 6 4 or d5, tries to just hit back immediately, or he just allows d2, d4 to come next move if he plays d6 and then drops the bishop back or something. Um, uh, but, but uh, you know, I mean, you feel that black should be able to uh, to punch punch back here somehow. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we do have a chat, so we're following the chat, and uh, please join the conversation there. And um, yeah, Kevin Winter says, uh, I've switched to the duo for seeing Italian, as d5 is a problem for white, I think. So um, cool. yeah, that's an interesting uh, comment. And I mean, uh, speaking of duo, he's obviously been working with Magnus uh, as well for, for many years now. And and probably one of the top players that has, uh, uh, you know, the most interesting ideas in the opening. So yeah, a very, 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 mm. very entertaining player, and he loves to sacrifice pawns and and get active play. Um, yeah, it's good to have those type of players as well among uh, the elite. That's right. Yeah. No. No. No question. And um, yeah, he's uh, he's certainly been a big help to Magnus, uh, hasn't he? Now for some years. Um, member of the team, of course. I think you were in Dubai, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was lucky. Yeah, I was lucky right. enough to, to be there for the whole match and um, helping out uh, with the. We had two reporters um, down there, Tanya Sapstev and uh, and a Danish reporter named uh, Rune. So yeah, I was working closely with them, and uh, yeah, a lot of fun. And uh, the first time I've ever been to a World Championship match. So. Um, mm. As, as a chess player, as a chess fan, it was, yeah, it was a dream come true. Right. And um, and we also have uh, had uh, Judith Polgar there. Um, she had, uh, she was doing commentary for, for Chess 24 with Anish Kiri. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I got to know her a little bit. What a lovely, uh, lovely woman. And yeah, so many interesting stories. Uh, so yeah, I was just uh, enjoying myself the, the, the whole time. Uh, great. Great match, and uh, I mean, a bit unfortunate that Nepomniachtchi seemed to collapse a bit after losing uh, game six. Also, that amazing game, uh, yes, yeah. But uh, I mean, it it happens, and uh, it's it's tough, I guess, to come back after after a loss like that uh, because he also had a really promising position in in that game. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I was watching the games here from London. I was helping out a little bit with some commentary here in London um, during the match. Mm. so keeping up to date but were there also many visitors many i mean local people coming and people like uh, you know chess visitors to the match was there a yeah, good atmosphere on the from that side yeah absolutely i mean you had you had people from all over the world coming uh, for the match so i met some norwegian people i met uh yeah people from uh, different asian countries african countries uh mm. south america so yeah people from all over the world were coming in and um, they also had this uh, 2020 Expo at the same time. Oh, that's right, yes. So, uh, so that was also interesting to to walk around a bit to the different pavilions. And uh, there was also, were, there, 
there were also uh, other stuff going on, you know, at the at the expo. So every day there was, was yeah, a lot of stuff, uh, different yeah. events, and uh, and Dubai yeah. is an amazing city, right? Anyway, yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, it's very fascinating. It's it's something different, you know. You don't you don't see a city like that uh, everywhere. Mm -hmm. So definitely uh, an interesting experience, and uh, yeah, it was a pleasure to 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 watch the games and uh, the match as a whole. Uh, from um, yeah, from front row seats almost. So mm. that was a lot of fun, and uh, and Magnus won. So yeah, uh, I mean he won. I guess as a Norwegian, um, you can be happy. <laughs> yeah, 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 I mean, uh, I mean, tried to be uh, objective, uh, but um, uh, yeah, of course it was it was fun to to see Magnus win, but. Um, uh, yeah, it was a tough, tough match, and had Nepomniachtchi won Game Six, who knows what would have yeah. happened. So, uh, uh, I guess you can go back in history as well, and 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 kind of see, okay, this was the turning point in the match, you know. And uh, no question, no question, yeah. So, uh, mm. so I think it's all. It's, okay, it's well, David, we're chatting here. David still hasn't moved um, after this. I think it's a, I won't say a sideline, but I mean, see through a little bit unusual, I think, and. Um, Almost certainly a move that David hasn't prepared, I think. Yeah. Um, he said something amusing over dinner last night, uh, didn't he, about uh, one of the earlier games where he'd prepared, I forget now, uh, to, to play 1e4. He came to the board and played 1d4 or something like that, you know? Yeah, yeah. He, he changed his mind uh, the very last minute. Uh, and I have to admit, I've done the same thing. So I don't know, uh, <laughs> I don't know what goes on, you know, in, in our heads when we suddenly prepare one thing and then we're like okay no I'm, I'm doing a completely different uh opening um yeah ah, sometimes it's just a feeling you get the last minute you know nerves um anticipation and um you know so um but um, tell me i'm sure david and Niels are good friends right so it must be quite uh of course they must have played many times over the board uh not as a, not in a match but in in single games yeah, um, I, mean, I wonder how they feel about this match, about being rivals uh, ten days in a row. You know, ten games yeah, in a row. It's 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 a bit interesting dynamic because you know they're good friends. Uh, usually we go out to dinner uh, after the games, and but I mean after one of them wins, it's the dynamic is a little bit uh, different, obviously. And um, uh, yeah, I mean it's it must be tough to to both be be friends and also rivals uh, for. At least 10, 10, 12 days here in London, and right. um, but people also seem to enjoy this. Uh, we don't have many matches like these anymore, oh. so so uh, the people watching seems to be uh, to be enjoying it, and uh, and also I think the the, the players were chosen because uh, they obviously are. Uh, at the same rating, uh, same level, and and um, they have different styles. So so the sponsor of the match wanted to to have two players with different styles to to get entertaining games, and I think we've definitely um, had that so far. Yeah, yeah. very good. Uh, can you tell us or tell me also a little bit about the price, the price, the structure of the price yeah. money? Yeah, absolutely. So um, so this is a quite interesting approach. Uh, from the organizer, um, so so the organizer wants to um, to give uh, incentive for for fighting chess and aggressive attacking chess. So the winner of each game gets um, uh, fifteen hundred pounds, which is a nice chunk of money for for one one win. And uh, if it's a draw, both players get five hundred pounds. Okay. And I thought if you if you lose the game, you don't get anything, but actually you do get two hundred pounds as a consolidation price if, if you lose a game so i believe uh, so far in the match uh, nils has won uh, 4200 pounds which is uh, yeah, a very decent amount of money and and with yesterday's win david is up to um uh 5700 pounds okay yeah, that's also also quite good money um very good. Okay. Yeah. So, but the overall winner of the match doesn't get an extra prize or bonus or something like that. No, I think uh, think uh, they will get you know some uh, some uh, champagne and flowers at the, <laughs> the prize giving ceremony. But they have no extra money for for the winner. So that's that's bragging rights. Uh, mm -hmm. 
but uh, I guess you, you shouldn't underestimate bragging rights. That's worth uh, something <laughs> on its own, uh, I guess. And uh, yeah, Kushik, uh, wondering what's the result so far. So yeah, David um, is up four and a half, uh, three and a half after yesterday's win. Um, so David has won two games and uh, Nils has won one win and six, uh, no, sorry, um, five draws. Five draws, yeah. So we have we have some moves now. We have a, interesting yeah. that David actually played d6. He didn't play d5, nor did he play knight 6 c4. He played yeah. more solidly, carefully, um, just and, uh, d6 and uh, sorry, uh, d6. And then, uh, yeah, Nils went for this other. Yeah, he didn't play d4, he played b4, as, as you mentioned, actually. Yeah, so this is interesting because. I think uh, the other day, um, commentating with Mihailo, he said that sometimes you, I mean, there's so many nuances in these openings, and and now you know White get all these moves with with uh, tempo. Uh, so now he followed up with a4. Okay. And now the question is, does does uh, David want to play a6 or a5? Five? A5, five, yeah. So I mean, uh, two uh, logical options there. Yeah, but both also, are both are very po both are very possible. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess if he goes a five, you have to consider moves like like b five, b five, and then I guess you go with the knight. I guess knight e seven. Yeah, seven, and then perhaps d four. Sure. Or, or play d five. Six. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, yeah. D five. Um, Many options for white as well. White doesn't have to rush with d4. He can play um, d3, bishop a3, you know, put the knight on d2. Um, yeah. Uh, or play knight a3 to c2. I mean, lots of options. You know, Absolutely. Uh, come around here. So it looks like a position where, for now at least, they have the chance to maneuver around a little bit. And then maybe they're postponing the, the fight in the center. Uh, just for right. a few moves. Um, so it will be interesting now to see uh, what. Uh... Mm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a6. No. It looks like, well, I mean, white has gained a bit of space on the queen side, um, but there's no, there's nothing concrete that, that happens as a result. I mean, white still has to, dis, to you know, develop his queen side, really. And now, I guess uh, the pro problem for white is that if you take, you cannot take back with the. Yeah, that makes, that makes no sense, correct. Because of uh, right. uh, this pin. And. Uh, you don't want to take back from the bishop, you know, this pawn is, is quite loose and... Uh, um, yeah, so white will play something else, he'll just start developing his pieces. Yeah. Um, as I say, maybe a move like knight a3, it's, it's not silly because the knight can come back to c2, um, yeah. you know, and support this d4 push. Um, so that's that's one, certainly one, uh, one way of developing that piece. Mm -hmm. And keep the pawn on d2 for now, keep it on d2 for now. And, yeah. um, so after so, a move like this, knight a3. Yeah, and just see what black does. I mean, David could play, again, do you play bishop b6 and sort of offer an exchange? Do you play bishop g4? Yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes in the in the Italian, I, I, I like this type of setups, but um, but also it looks tempting to go to, to g4 because this um, pin is quite annoying as well. Um, exactly, yeah, that's right. But um, yeah, I guess it's a bit, uh, bit up to what what style and type of positions you you prefer. Because after this, you have to consider something like this, which I believe is quite fine for black. Um, uh, nice to have this uh, half open f file for the rook. Uh, you yes. have some extra um, oh, of the d5 square. Yeah, I mean, probably White won't uh, rush to take on, on E6, I think, yeah. if Bishop E6 were to happen. Then maybe you just uh, prepare. Uh, the only thing is that you prevent uh, Knight C2, I guess. Um, right. yeah. Maybe you either go Queen B3 or... Sure, Queen B3 is a good move, yeah, or D3. Or D3 maybe, yeah, mm -hmm. D3 looks good. Uh, yeah. But it's interesting because often in, in the opening phase you 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 have this fight in the center of the of the board, uh, so we might see a position now where there uh, 
two boxers in the ring, you know, and running, <laughs> jumping around a little bit and, and postponing uh, the big... Hey, chess uh, boxing. Have you ever been to a chess boxing fight? Uh, no, I haven't. But um, I know uh, Lawrence Trent is, is uh, a fan of both boxing and obviously a good and strong chess player. So, and, and Matt, <laughs> Matt here at the chess shop. He, That's he right. Is boxing. So, yeah, I would love love to, to, go, to go to a match. Hmm. Uh, what about you? Have you ever... Well, I've been to a couple, yeah, as a spectator, I should say. <laughs> Not as a participant, but um, I went uh, in, in December, actually, yeah. Um, to, a, to a fight, actually, Matt was supposed to go, but he couldn't, uh, unluckily. Um, but I, I went along, um, and uh, it was great, uh, great entertainment, I have to say. It's a good night out. And um, statistically, how, how does these matches, uh, how, how, do, how do you most often win? Do you win on the board or in the, in the ring? Yeah, that's a good question. Probably more on, well, you, you better check with Matt. I think mm, I think you probably win more uh, through chess than through boxing, but um, but it's a good question, yeah. You need to be good at both. You need to be able to survive sort of five rounds of boxing. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, to play reasonable chess. And, and, um, yeah, I, I mean, the crowd love it. I mean, you know, the crowd, the spectators, a lot of young people go to watch and real enthusiasm and passion. <laughs> and uh, it's fun it's fun mm -hmm. yeah and uh, i mean we um we have been challenging david a little bit on on the champions chess tour to to try uh, different uh, activities combined with chess <laughs> okay for instance he played this um uh chili challenge match with with magnus at the good night bar in in oslo mm. uh, so for every piece the opponent took you had to uh, to have this uh, very spicy chili, and and David uh, is not a big fan of of uh, spices <laughs> and and spicy food. Mm. So uh, yeah, he was sweating, and uh, yeah, probably got uh, got beat on the board as well. So um, yeah, and then we went uh, ice uh, ice dipping. And oh, playing. I read about that. Yeah, I think I saw some pictures. Yeah. So I, I played David in a bullet match where he was uh, underwater in uh, yeah in the winter time in in Oslo. So. <laughs> it's, uh, it's interesting to see uh, different um, combinations you can do with chess and other sports or, or activities. So, uh, right, yeah. Mm. And Jovanka also taking part in these challenges as well? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, so, yeah, uh, Jovanka joined the ice dipping uh, challenge. Uh, but I mean, she, she likes to take cold showers. And so that was. She told uh, me that. She told me that. She didn't yeah. used to, but now she does. Yeah. And. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I was expecting her to kind of enjoy it more than David. So, but now I'm surprised David uh, goes uh, goes ice dipping uh, voluntarily, and <laughs> they have these nice uh, saunas uh, close to the the new opera in Oslo city center. So, uh, yeah, I think we've been there a couple times at least uh, this this winter already. So I like that word voluntarily. He does it voluntarily. <laughs> <laughs> okay, A five. We have a move. He's played A five. A7, A5, we spoke uh, about this move, and I think Niels is going to play B4 to B5. Yeah. The knight will drop back, we assume, to E7. And then the question is, what does Niels do? What does he do? Does he play knight A3, or does he play another move? Um, yeah. I like this idea to, to bring the knight back and then prepare um, something like this, perhaps. And the Nils actually puts out P5, and uh, we have 97. 97. Another question is uh, okay. He goes straight for P4 me. straight away. Okay. Interesting. Maybe Nils has um, either prepared this line or he's had it before in a game, and he's sort of he's, he's following some something prepared, you know? Yeah. Um, the question now, I guess you don't want to take. Right, because then you just allow white. Well, let's to, have uh, a look. Let's have. I mean, I was wondering if black could play d5 here, d6, d5, to sort of force uh, after takes, after takes, uh, after takes, yeah, after takes. Ah, this is a good five, one. Yeah. To sort of force an isolated queen spawn position. Um, I think one problem is that white now has this bishop a3 is this nice diagonal for his bishop. Yeah. Um, plenty of activity for white. Rook e8. Uh, I don't know, just uh, maybe knight e5, maybe knight bd2. Yeah. 
looks um looks uh yeah looks okay for for white i guess um, yeah certainly okay for white yeah um but so as we mentioned white. mentioned earlier i mean yeah d5 is is one of the moves um, black often wants to achieve uh in the opening to try and, and break up the center and um if it's allowed to do so often black is doing okay uh, as well um are there other other moves to consider here for for uh, black? Oh, I'm sure there are other moves. Yeah, I mean maybe uh, maybe knight g6 yeah. is possible. Um, don't forget also I've just seen um, that that when white plays a move like d takes e5 here, black does have knight g4. No, after knight g6. I mean yeah. sorry, after knight g6. So knight g6. Let, let's say even just to analyze pawn takes pawn here, d takes e5. But black does have knight g4 as well. Let's not forget that black does have knight ah, g4. Yeah. Uh, it can be can be quite annoying, huh? Attacking f2. So something white needs to just keep keep, keep in mind. Um, yeah, this looks a bit yeah, fishy for white, you know? Looks a bit. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I think d, d takes e5 is just a, probably not the right move, but um, maybe sure. white needs to throw in h3 uh, at some point. Yeah. I mean, that's a useful move. Uh, in the Italian opening, anyways, I guess H. Uh, of course, yeah. Um, of course, preventing these uh, jumps. Yeah, so maybe I I like knight j six. Um, yeah, I mean the knight on e seven clearly uh, is is looking to come to g six anyway. Um, so uh, I don't know if Black could play bishop g four here. Maybe maybe not. Bishop g four. But the only thing, you know what this move reminds me of, uh, Stuart? It's probably a decent move, but it reminds me of this famous Paul Murphy game, you know, at the one night at the opera. Yeah. <laughs> where his opponent, he tried to he tried to defend the e5 by going bishop g4 in the opening. And then right, he had to take on f3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then he had to take on f3, and then uh, yeah. he was crushed in 17 moves. But uh, You remember that game? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I remember the game. It was a brilliant game. Yeah. Um. So maybe knight g6. Um, let's have a quick look. I should also let's have a quick look at uh, Askelet. If take on d4, e takes d4, c takes d4, and now bishop g4. What will happen then? Yeah, this uh, this looks good. And now I guess d5 is. Um... Yeah, I mean uh, I'm threatening to double the pawns on f3, so I suppose. Um... Yeah. Because of the d4 weakness, yeah, That's problem. Um, I mean, white has bishop b2. White has uh, moves there, but yeah. But you see, if you play bishop b2, now I could play d5, and I have an improved bishop b2. Sorry, bishop b2. Yeah. To defend the d pawn, now I could play d5 as back, and I have a better version than what we were yeah. looking at before. You see. Absolutely. Yeah. This looks. Uh... This looks good. A much better version, yeah. Um, so I think white should look for better than this. I think white should do something else. Um, yeah, I mean, it doesn't seem like white has has a lot in this uh, this position. Yeah, I mean, maybe the knight on d five is is doing a great job. Uh, yeah, of course, white. It's okay for white. White can still play knight b d two. And the game goes on. Yeah. The game goes on. Um, yeah, and if you get out of the pin, I guess you know have a nice square on e5. Absolutely, yeah. Queen b3, and then knight still actually maybe quite nice for white. In fact, yes, that's right. Knight e5 coming after after move the queen. Rooks in. Okay, but um, at least some ideas for for black as well. Um, yeah, so black could maybe take on d4. Yeah, looks looks like a concession, but then he. Um, it's follow. a very direct approach now from from Nils. Um, you can almost feel that he's he's going for it, you know, in his last game with the the white pieces. Last and, game with white, yeah, revenge. Yeah. Um, for as you said, for, as yeah, you said, the white has been better in in all the games. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if Nils is pushing for for a win today. And look at what, well, no, for sure, for sure he's pushing for a win, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's his uh, objective. Um, look at the clock times as well. Um, there's sort of 20, more than 20 minute difference uh, on the clocks, which um, indicates some sort of pressure, I think, on black. Yeah. Uh, 
And again, I'm not surprised David is taking his time, but but I guess we can also assume that um, he has to to think a little bit. He's maybe out of his preparation already, and um, if he had a preparation, I mean, <laughs> if he had a preparation, <laughs> it looked like after C three, he it was a bit uh, hmm. uh, out of book, maybe already there. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, they probably played. Uh, Tens or hundreds of games in in similar positions, at least. But um, maybe this is also a good moment to to remind everyone or, or mention that David, of course, doesn't play as much professionally yep. as as Niels. I mean, let's let's be honest. Absolutely. Um, um, so so you would expect Niels to be uh, a bit uh, better prepared, I think, uh, just in general, because he's a more active player because of David's other commitments. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point, and. Uh, I think I mentioned a few times earlier in the match that you know David just wants to 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 get out of the opening with a, with a playable position and then hmm. then slowly try and and get some initiative and and take his chance if if he gets it. Um, so yeah, in terms of strengths as players, I I would say probably that Nils is a better opening expert or more of an opening expert than than David. But but having said that, you know these players are so strong and. They have so much knowledge uh, about the openings, and uh, but sometimes I guess you just need to double check things as well. You know, you're trying to um, remember different lines. You're trying to to figure out the the position. And um, we have a we have a suggestion from the chat: uh, Bishop E6, uh, Giacomo Rizzi. Uh, In this position, yeah, Bishop E6. Well, okay. Because it, I guess White never wants to play d5 here. So. No, d5 I definitely wouldn't play as white. Well. I might play a move like knight a3 or knight bd2 just to uh, bring the knight towards the center if you take on c4. I think I would probably probably choose knight a3 though. I don't think I'd rush to take on e6 because as we said, f takes e6 opens the f file. Yeah. Um, and so this looks okay for. Yeah, um, I don't think we can take on e5. And, um, that's probably not what White should do. I think Knight A2 would be my uh, would yeah. be my response. But a good question. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So yeah, keep um, keep them coming. The the move suggestions. If you have any questions at all, we'll try and answer as uh, as best we can. Um, join the join the conversation. Okay, so D D and he played that instantly, didn't he? Um, D2 yeah. to D4 really just bashed it out straight away. You know? Yeah, because we were looking at other other sensible options to prepare it a bit, uh, maybe bring the knight back, uh, and then go for this uh, hmm. this idea. So yeah, um, seems like Nils Nils is well prepared, and uh, yeah, it's also interesting, Stuart, that um, the Italian opening is is back in fashion because. Ooh last 20 years you know after Kramnik uh played Kasparov and did so well in the Berlin yeah. um it's it's um at top level it's been a very uh frequently played opening uh, and uh, it's good it's it's a bit refreshing to see actually you know the Italian opening uh back mm. back in fashion uh, and, it, and it is a quite uh, exciting opening it's not as uh, dry as uh, one would think Right. Yeah, well, it's a very rich, I mean, chess is such a rich game. I think this this is uh, exactly as you're saying. Um, and we've mentioned, uh, you mentioned just a, a short time ago, Paul Morphy and a very, an immortal game of his, yeah. um, you know, uh, there wasn't quite this variation, uh, but, um, you know, chess is sort of endless, isn't it? And the fact that you can play sort of 18th century, 19th century chess, just to get into the game, get into the middle game and avoid the sort of concrete computer generated uh, variations that we see, of course, um in many uh, in many games so um and here the players are on their own i think certainly david seems to be um out of his comfort zone out of his uh, theoretical knowledge um so uh yeah sure i mean uh, the italian game is, uh, is is a great choice for people who maybe haven't got the time as well also amateur players who love chess who, who want to play chess but haven't got the time maybe to study the berlin or the marshal or yeah. the sort of mainline spanishes of which there are so many um complicated variations yeah, absolutely. And um, yeah, it's interesting because this is the third 
the third game uh, in a row uh, where Nils has the white pieces and we see the, the Italian game. So it's also good for the viewers because they, they get some insight into to different plans, both for white and black, and uh, mm. get some ideas, you know, how to approach approach that opening. So, um, so that's very good. And um, yeah, I, I've never seen, you know, uh, Rook A3. Uh, yeah. From from the Italian game, so nice. yeah, just some just shows how yeah, as you said, how rich chess mm. actually is, and um, all the different uh, ideas that can uh, evolve. Um, so, yeah, so, so would you say would you say us because would you say that Niels is basically a one e four player? He doesn't I mean because David has switched, doesn't he? He switches between one e four one d four. Yeah, I, I think Niels so. keeps pressing with one e four. He, he plays e4. He's an e4 player, and and um, I mean, I guess at top level chess, um, it's an advantage if you are able to switch a little bit. You know, hmm. uh, you can play e4, d4, uh, c4, uh, knight f3, um, simply because then it's a bit more tricky to prepare um, against you. But um, at the same time, if if you specialize in in one opening move. Then uh, I guess you have the time and, and energy to kind of go all in on, on that specific uh, opening move, and then you try to become a, a specialist, you know, in the Italian game, in mm. different uh, Spanish uh, openings, as you mentioned. And um, what what's I mean, your preferred uh, opening move? Uh, well, I, I used to. I mean, I don't, I don't really play uh, events uh, anymore. But I mean, when I was playing, I used to try to experiment and play different openings with white and black. Uh, and uh, to um, sort of widen my knowledge, maybe not in depth, but in, in width, you know, so sort of to uh, experience different uh, different lines, prepare different things, and keep uh, keep one's opponent guessing as well. Um, not to try to walk into uh, preparation, but um, to have the element of surprise uh, almost every game. But maybe it's not the most practical, probably I, I, I should have... Um, uh, narrowed my repertoire a little bit and, and sort of concentrated on going deeper in in some lines. Um, and, uh, and and as a chess player, uh, how I mean, how would you describe your playing style? <laughs> um, yeah, probably. Uh, well, a bit, uh, yeah, it's good. It's difficult, huh? You put yeah. me on the spot. <laughs> I think uh, I I tried to play. Um, Offbeat, a little bit offbeat, you know. I wouldn't say eccentric, but but offbeat and, and sort of. For me, I, I used to get uh, a bit frustrated sometimes with um, the the way. And I'm talking about 20 years ago, in fact, uh, or, or 15 years ago, uh, of, of openings developing very fast in in certain uh, lines uh, and and people preparing, uh, you know, to move 15, move 18, move 20. And uh, I used to try to avoid conflict in the opening. So I would happily, or not happily, but uh, choose to play maybe slightly dubious lines. Uh, you know, I'd play like on the modern or, or Alakine's defense we spoke of earlier. Little mm -hmm. sidelines here and there, um, or sidelines. So I, so I, I try to avoid main lines generally and have a bit of, take, take a few risks as well, to be honest. And the thing is, when it goes bad, then it, it can go really bad if you play like that. Um, well, but that sounds interesting. And uh, yeah, I agree with you must be a bit a bit boring and uh, not as much fun you know to always play the uh, the main lines and uh, you play theory for 15 18 moves and then mm. uh, it's also difficult I guess to to kind of uh, create uh, exciting positions because you know down the road <laughs> what type of position that will occur yeah after, after 15 yeah. moves so yeah that's that's cool but uh, but so but you know but probably wasn't the most practical uh, approach that, that I took. And also, if you I mean, like David, we spoke about time travel. I had a big problem with with getting into time travel, and it's something I didn't uh, really uh, handle or, mm -hmm. or get over during my uh, playing career. Let's say so. And of course, if you're having to think on move five or six already because you're not familiar with the opening, or you're playing something a bit risky and you need to find a very accurate way to play, especially as black. Um, it means that you have less time for the middle game, and then it has a you know a sort of domino effect. Um, so that's the the other side of playing too many different openings is that you you tend to need more time to navigate them. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it must be, I mean, it must be difficult if we're a young, talented chess player these days, how to, um, obviously you want to, to spend many hours each day studying chess, but then also how to kind of divide that time to what should you focus on? You know, should you focus on opening? Uh, should you still work on uh, puzzles, you know, uh, develop a good tactical eye, uh, study end games, right. which uh, is always important to know your end games, and uh, and also to get you know the uh, the experience of just playing a lot of chess. So it's uh, yeah, it's not easy to to navigate uh, in that sense, I guess. Something interesting that David said uh, over dinner last night, Askel, you remember talking about playing online, of course, something that is exploded since I was a, a young man and, and starting my career. He's taken on D4, look, uh, it's chess online, of course. And also now we have many very strong, like the best players in the world all play online now and again. And um, with, uh, you know, all, all kinds of events and prize money and everything. And, and David's saying that when he plays online, he tends to play all kinds of openings, which he wouldn't normally play in serious games, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's like the training ground, isn't it? You know, to play yeah, online. Uh, it's it's a great way to 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 try new openings, to to test the stuff you want to to uh, to find out if it's working for you. And I also have to admit, I do I do believe some players uh, try to um, maybe maybe David, you know, has has played some some strange openings before this match in case Nils have uh, checked his online games, you know, to. Right. To, to not give anything away um, before this uh, very um, this very exciting match here, here in London. So um, and also Magnus, I'm sure even Magnus has plays things online which he would never normally play in a, in a serious uh, match just to practice and and, yeah. uh, and try things mm -hmm. out. And uh, I mean, it's interesting. Magnus would will often play you know hundred to two hundred games in in one night. You know, bullet chess against one of some of the best players in the world. And and sometimes he and Aliresa Perusha, you know, will play 40, 50 games a bullet. And uh yeah, that's quite uh just for fun, right? Just, yeah, for, just fun. for fun, you know, Friday night play 50, 50 bullet games. And uh but uh yeah. I mean which which other sport or discipline can we think of where the two let's if Aliresa is the number two of the man, if the top two players in the world just have yeah. play, playing each other like that. Yeah. for hours and hours on a Friday night, you know? Uh, it's amazing, yeah. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. And uh, yeah, it just goes to show that they love chess, you know? It's uh, it's obviously their occupation, but uh, they're also chess fans and uh, yeah, just love love the game. Yeah. So that's very interesting. And uh, uh, Stuart, we have a question for you from uh, Mick, uh, Mick Hurley. Um, can you ask Stuart about his career, how he peaked young but didn't reach uh, the highest level. <laughs> what what uh, was it? Just other distractions in life, um, or yeah. And respect to Stuart, he's a grandmaster, and I'm just curious about uh, the balance between uh, chess and and life. You know. Uh, mm, interesting. Well, a lot of philosophical uh, question. Yeah, that's nice, man. <laughs> Um, well, what can I say? Uh, you know, chess is a tough game and it's a tough job. It's a tough profession. We all know that. And uh, you reach certain limits by putting in a lot of work. I worked hard when I was young and, um, of course, uh, took the game very seriously. It was my career and um, no regrets uh, whatsoever, you know, and I, I achieved certain things. I think I, did, I certainly won uh, some, some good, important tournaments. Um, later, I became a British champion once. Uh, I was uh, world under 16 champion when I was 14. So wow. um, that was an early uh, success, a, bit, a bit massive success for me, you know. But um, yeah, as I say, it's just as tough. And, uh, you know, at some point you reach this sort of a plateau, you know, and I got to 2600. And my highest rating was 2601. That was my maximum published FIDO rating, um, which meant something, I mean, something today. Do you remember Sorry? which year was that? Do you remember? Um, I, 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 it was something like uh, 2000. And, I was going to say 2001 because that's when I qualified for the FIDE Knockout um, World Championship. Um, it may have been around about then. Yeah, I think 2001. Um, long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, yeah. But, but then you you kind of hit yeah. the wall or a plateau, as I say, and then 
I mean, uh, and I, I wasn't so young then either, you know. And um, it's just, you know, you kind of reach a limit and probably I could have worked harder and, and, and done things differently and, and got a bit higher than that and more kept, kept that sort of level. I think at the time that was, I was world uh, number 88 or 86 or something. So of course, ratings have sort of inflated and, and 2601 now is no longer such a big deal. Maybe of course it still means a lot. Um, but uh, yeah, so life gets in the way. Well, yeah, sure. I mean, um, also talent gets in the way if you haven't got enough of it, you know? And, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 you know, I guess I, I, I lack some things which, which other players uh, had more of, uh, you know? Um, Call it talent or, or or capacity for work and uh, and so on. But uh, hey, no hard feelings. And uh, you know, chess, as as we know, is a lovely game. And um, you get to travel a lot. You get to meet a lot of wonderful people. And um, you know, there's nothing like it, really. So a lot of people probably look up to me and say, "Hey, I, I wish I'd achieved what you achieved. I wish I could have got to where we where you got to." You know, so there's always people above you and below you. You know. Yeah. Exactly. That's, that's the way it is. So, um, hey, so David took on D4. Yeah, um, let's catch up with the... Uh, but thank you for that question, by the way. The gentleman who asked that question uh, can talk yeah. more about some other things later, maybe. Yeah, so he took on D4. So he takes D4. And now David actually played the, a move that we looked at uh, earlier. Um, well, I mentioned this move, didn't I? Yeah. Yes. So he didn't play Bishop G4. Um, he played D5 immediately. Yes, we were looking at this idea to go here, uh, bishop g4, maybe. And maybe d5 next, yeah. Then this. So it's it's, it's quite similar, but uh, again, um, both players are playing uh, very direct, I would say. Uh, and uh, yeah, in many, many different lines, I guess, as we mentioned, this is the move uh, Black wants to achieve uh, in this opening. And if he's able to have have a knight on, on d5, I would say that's a that's a, that's a success for, for David because then this bishop will never have a good future because of the the pawn on d4. And uh, um, if he can develop the pieces, get out with you know the bishop, the rooks. It's not so easy to see how how white can uh, can. Um, get a big advantage. So this is the current position and uh, Nils took. Um, I'm just wondering whether David needs to recapture immediately here on d5 with his e7. Um, ah, that's very good maybe, point. He could, maybe he could play something else here, I don't know. Again, yeah. bishop g4, I don't know. Here can we transpose to, to this position? Uh, we might, bishop we a3, might, right, is a problem. Yeah, we might have to look at, uh, yeah, then you have to go here. It looks a bit funny for black, doesn't it? Yeah. And then the question, yeah, it's, it's a bit double-edged. Um, Even knight c3 might be a good move now. Um, it looks a bit funny. I don't like this. Uh, yeah. yeah. Looks a bit strange. Um, so okay, so let's take back. Let's take back. Yeah. Take here. And now with bishop a3, I guess you can go here and... Uh, what about what about knight b4, Askel? What about knight b4? Just to have a quick look. After bishop a3. Ah, uh, bishop a3. Let's not forget ah, about knight b4. Ah, interesting. Maybe uh, maybe he could do this. Yeah. And uh, if... Um, well, yeah. And what happens? I don't know. Yeah, this, this is a good move. Um, even ready to give a pawn up on the, on that if, if I have yeah. to later on, you know. Uh, yeah, I guess White will never take this. Uh, no, I don't think so. Not now. But uh, I, I think night before is probably um, weak on, on the the dark squares. Um, yeah, that's a that's an interesting uh, interesting move for sure. Um, yeah. And Black could put his bishop on f five, in fact, because he has uh, something on c two. Maybe he should could yeah. come to f five as well as g four. Absolutely. Um, mm. Maybe, you know, so some, yeah. some ideas. So I guess, yeah, I guess David should take back. Um, if this doesn't work, um, I mean, maybe can he, I guess he can prepare with maybe rook e8, but. Looks a bit strange to me, rook e8. Yeah, yeah. it looks a bit, uh, it's a bit odd. Yeah, so maybe just take back and then. 
I guess so. What, should we just have a quick look at knight f6 takes d5? What's the difference? Uh, let's see. Can we argue that that's a better move? Because on bishop a3, I can still play knight b4. Yeah. Um, and also, I guess um, an interesting difference is that you have the, um, the chance to go here as well if you want to create some more. Yeah, possibly. Factors, or you can, um, yeah, or just this move. Looks good. Bishop f5. Um, so, I mean, it's maybe white shouldn't rush to play bishop a3. Maybe white should be looking at something else, yeah. But uh, you know, Queen B three maybe. Um, yeah, that's cool. You know, and then um, yeah. Now I guess it's it's a little bit annoying if you now you know want to play rookie eight at some point. You have a lot. You need of to watch that. That's right. Problems. No. But in fact, I can just take on D five. Then I think you lose a piece. Then you Bishop takes D five. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, you can just uh, just take. Yeah, yeah, well, maybe not. It might not. Maybe it might not. But um, yeah. But a move like yeah, queen b three looks um, looks like an option. The thing is, if we look at knight e seven takes d five, as skilled. If we go back one move, let's have a look again at knight e takes, which was the first one. Well, my anyway, in sort of instinctively um, chose that move. What about bishop g five instead of bishop a three? How about if the bishop comes to g five instead? Sorry. Um, if white plays bishop g5, is there any sense in pinning? If instead of bishop a3, what about bishop g5? Mm -hmm. Maybe that sets um, some problems. Just, just to pin and uh, sort of try to annoy black a little bit. And continue with knight bd2 and queen b3 and knight e5, those kinds of moves. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, this looks, uh, yeah, looks comfortable for, for white. And uh, I think he's played knight e takes d5. Yeah. And also, just uh, just one other point. If you take with this knight, I just feel in some, some lines you might also have some trouble on h7, you know, in this, uh, with some easy targets. Yeah, maybe let's to... go, possibly. But uh, yeah, anyways, he took on um, here. And, uh, and look at that. Niels has played instantly queen b3. How do you, how do you feel about that? Instantly no, queen b3. I mean, I, I would assume that Niels has seen this position um, before. Mm. Uh, he only spent, you know, five minutes um, plus, plus some increments. But David is down to 45 minutes. So um, it's me. What, is, what a difference. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's something I can tell you also, sorry, as a, as a professional player before, um, and of course you, everyone knows this as well, uh, what I'm going to say now is that when you, when, you, when you have a long thing, so David's had quite a big thing there about the last two or three moves, taking on d4, d5, and, and, and so on, and then when the replies come back instantly, such as queen v3, that's yeah. so annoying, it's so, it's like, it's very tough, you know, yeah. it's very tough to deal with that because you've spent all this extra time, and you haven't even made your opponent think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's it's uh, frustrating. It's it's irritating. Um, and um, and now I mean the idea of bringing the bishop out seems quite. Uh... You see how he didn't rush to play bishop a three. He's kept that in reserve. Yeah. Um, um, so as you say, he could still play bishop g five, um, depending on what uh, David does. So, um, okay, let's think, what, what should David do? What, uh, what can we think of for David after queen b3? Sorry, uh, let's see, queen b3. I mean, should he take a timeout with h6? Can he play h6 here or not? Yeah. At some point, uh, I would like to bring out the bishop as well, but you have to look yeah, at... Uh... 
What would you play for black here? What, what kind of candidate moves would you be looking at as black after queen b3? Um, that's a very good question. Um, developing the bishop, right? Yeah, I mean, I would love to develop the bishop and then maybe if I have time, just play queen. So we go with the bishop, for example, queen d7 and then bring the rooks. Maybe something like that, uh, but where to go? Uh, yeah, and also queen d7 is going to run into knight e5 all the time. So it's where does yeah. black put his queen, in fact, to connect? Yeah, that's, that's annoying. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not easy after um, to find uh, to find good moves for uh, for black. Um, so this is the current position, right? This is the current position. David to play and. Um, I would love to just exchange some pieces uh, for black, but it's that that's not easy either because you cannot go here. Um, I don't think so. No. And um, yeah, you need to bring this rook into the game. But um, okay, so let's try it six. Let's just see. Let's see if black has time to play it six. All right. So. Um, then if bishop comes to a3, you'll play knight b4, I guess. Yeah. How is that? I'm, I'm happy to. Yeah, I mean. Um... Yeah, this looks good. And then uh, possibly you can go here. Yeah, I don't know if white can e immediately play knight e5, you see, in that position after knight b4. Mm -hmm. Can Niels immediately play knight e5 and hitting f7 and leaving d4, the d4 pawn, because he's attacking f7. Um... It's like a crisis uh, moment, yeah? Yeah, this is... Ooh, maybe can we take uh, with the queen? Well, maybe we can, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can, but then f7 drops. Yeah. So you take with the... Um, Let's try bishop. bishop. Uh, king h7, I guess, yeah. I mean, it could be the black's okay because black's also threatening lots of things. Yeah. Um, F2 and A1, yeah, certainly F2. Oh, right. Good threat. Um, yeah, possibly this is uh, this is a way to play. I really like the idea you had that you found, Stuart, with uh, bringing the knight to, to B4 to cover um, yeah, well, the diagonal and uh, possibly give up the pawn, but I think yeah, black is just happy to. Sure. Don't forget, I have if, even if you take twice on b4, I have bishop a5 uh, yep. winning the exchange, you know. So even uh, as even long as that rook is on e1, I have this trick. Yeah. Uh, exactly. Um, well, let's see. Yeah, maybe maybe h6. Um, it's it's, it's hard to find any other. I mean, other good moves. Uh, well, let's try. Let's try something else. Let's try. Can, um, can you? Okay. Go? Let's try queen d6. The same idea to so bring uh, the knight here, uh, and then then bring the bishop out. I mean, if if black just had a couple of moves here to to try and coordinate a little bit, hmm. uh, would make it uh, make it easier. But um, yeah, it, it just feels a little bit loose. Uh, this uh, this setup. With the knights mm. and after after queen b3, just feels a little bit loose, and you have some uh, some ideas targeting the f7 square and. Uh... I mean, if David plays bishop b6, I'm assuming, or we we are assuming that knight g5 is the problem, right? Yeah. This looked a bit annoying, but maybe maybe it's okay. Maybe it's okay, and maybe because. Um, this is a on, right? on D4. Mm -hmm. So maybe David is uh, happy to, or not happy, but maybe he can allow himself to. Uh, play bishop e6, yeah. What about bishop a3, though? If you play bishop e6 instead of knight g5, if I play bishop a3, now you can no longer play knight b4. Ah, that's a good point. So we have to. Now go... you have to play, we assume, rook e8. So this also changes something. Yeah, also, just maybe knight bd2, it's simply develop. Yeah. Um, and uh, now you have the problem with your queen as black. Where do you put your queen? Yeah, this is a very 
annoying threat if we go to to d7. Um, mm. It's not easy for Black, is it? No, he's uh, he's definitely struggling a bit to to develop and. Uh, um, yeah, I think queen b3 was a yeah, very good move. Um, and see David, I mean, he's already down to under 40 minutes uh, already. Um, and I might... Oscar, just tell us a little bit, sorry, just tell us a bit about the venue. Have you been to the venue? I've, I've seen pictures across. Um, Have you been to the venue? I've, I've just been outside the venue, actually. Um, but it is uh, in the, the Swedish... Uh, residence uh, and, and uh, apparently uh, the son of the Swedish ambassador is a big chess fan and oh, fantastic. Uh, I believe um, Malcolm Payne uh, one of the organizers of this match uh, met with the, the Swedish ambassador at the London Classic right last year and then um, uh, obviously Nils being from Sweden then he suggested have it, having the match uh, at the Swedish uh, residence and I mean, you can see uh, on the on the the video stream that uh, I mean the the venue is fantastic, like playing in this um, uh, eighteen hundred style, uh, probably same locations as Morphy used to play when he was traveling Europe in the eighteen fifties and sixties. Um, is it? Are we talking about the actual embassy? Is it this, you say the residence? Is, is it the same as the embassy? Yeah, yeah, it's the embassy. So, um, so it's just five minute walk from the the chess shop in uh, Baker Street, mm. and uh, yeah, so the players will actually join us uh, after the game. They will have a quick walk from the embassy and uh, and join us here at the at the, the chess uh, shop. And I mean, the players are super happy with uh, the venue, um, and uh, yeah, I think it was. Uh, was a nice experience for the ambassador's son to to meet uh, to uh, such great uh, chess players and i think he also this the son has been following the champions chess tour where david you know is the star star commentator so um yeah and david told me also been you know recognized a few times in london already so uh, yeah chess is becoming uh, big i'm sure david is recognized a lot in oslo yeah, actually, yeah, but mostly old old men. So uh, he's hoping, <laughs> he's hoping to, to be recognized, you know, by uh, by other people. Uh, other people as well. But uh, no, I have a funny story. Um, close to one year ago, we went out for a drink uh, in springtime in Oslo city center, and it was me, Magnus, and and David. And uh, this old guy came up to our table and he asked for a photo with David. Mm. While Magnus was there, and he didn't wow. even pay attention to Magnus, so, so <laughs> David was, you know, the big star at the table. So I think uh, that was a confidence boost for, for David, for sure. Yeah. I wonder how Magnus felt about that. Yeah, I mean, maybe he thought, <laughs> okay, nice to, nice to get a break for once, but uh, yeah. I mean, imagine, imagine the guy had come and asked for your autograph, you know, and avoided yeah. and ignored the other two. Yeah, that would be, uh, be something. So. Uh, yeah, so in, uh, yeah, I mean, David is uh, living in Oslo now, so he's enjoying life more and more. Um, I really felt sorry for him because once he arrived uh, November uh, 2020, he had to spend his 30th birthday, you know, um, alone in quarantine at a hotel. So, um, well, because of COVID, right? Because of the yeah, quarantine of and everything. Um, we had this yeah. long lockdown from November 2020 to May. 2021 and uh, yeah so first few months were yeah quite challenging and, and also the winter in, in Norway isn't uh, it can be a bit harsh if you're not used to it mm. but once the spring came and uh, things started to open up um, he also got some new friends in Oslo mm. uh, so yeah I think uh, he's just enjoying life more and more now uh, these days at least and is David speaking in some Norwegian? Uh, I, I should ask. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, he knows a few words. So I think if he uh, if he was motivated to to learn, try and learn the language, I'm sure he he would be able to do so. Um, because I do think chess players, uh, well, some at least, um, have uh, what's the what's the word? Um, have a better chance of, of learning languages than, mm. than maybe some other people. So um, I think you're right. Yeah. Have a good ear, you know, for music and for for languages and and so on. Um, that's my impression, at least. So 
So hopefully one good. day he can he can yeah. you know start uh, communicating in Norwegian. That would be be fun. But uh, mm. I suspect he knows some of the bad words, you know, as we always learn the first. Uh, so I hope you didn't teach him any. No, 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 no. I've been uh, I've been a good boy. So uh, so hopefully, yeah, in uh, in the future he can uh, can learn some more Norwegian. That's actually one of the challenges I want to give him that we send him to this Norwegian uh, exam. And then oh, uh, we, we film it, you know, and, uh, and uh, follow his progress leading up to the exam. And uh, yeah, that would be fun. Oh, okay. And um, we do have a couple of uh, questions. I think we'll have a break uh, shortly, but let's just have a couple of uh, oh. uh, questions. Uh, Giacomo wondering, is uh, C6 an option for, for uh, Black? Just to try and, and help out the night on uh, sure. B5. Good question. C6. I mean, uh, well, I, I, my first reaction is that it's, it's playable, um, but it's also a concession because it kind of loosens the bishop on b6. Um, and uh, white will continue probably with the kind of moves we've been saying, like knight bd2 or maybe bishop g5. Um, and then white has this extra lever, if you like, on the queen side. That more or less, when he wants, he'll be able to take on c6. Yeah. Um, because I don't think Black wants to take on B5 himself. Um, I think it's just, I mean, I think White's doing really well here. Yeah. I like White's position. I agree it, may, it may be that David has to play C6 at some point, but I don't think he wants to do it um, unless he's forced to. I guess, uh, yeah. And, and also White doesn't want to take now because this looks okay for Black. And then also you can try and get the Rook in. Uh, exactly. I mean, so much in chess is about timing. You know, when you, when yeah. you play a, an exchange, a pawn takes pawn, for example. Um, here it's in White's interests, I think, to wait. Uh, and and Black uh, probably doesn't want to play c6, as I say, unless he really... Uh, I think Black's problems are his queen's bishop and where he puts his queen. Those are the kind of things he needs to solve. Yep. Um, though, those are the big questions for Black, I think. Although one one interesting point, though, with c6, it, it does open up a square for the for the queen, possibly. At this some is true. This is go true. Here and then try and bring the rooks. Uh, so, yeah, I mean... This yeah. is true. Yeah, maybe, so, maybe it's it's playable. Mm, uh, absolutely, good point. Yeah, That's a very good uh, good uh, suggestion. And uh, let's see, we had a couple more. Brian saying hi, good evening, and uh, good to good to have you here, uh, Brian. And um, yeah, we had a question for you, um, Stuart. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So um, yeah. Uh, one from the chat was um, was asking you about uh, whether or not you believe Magnus has the chance to reach uh, 2,900 in rating, and and how would you kind of uh, rate his uh, world champion reign uh, so far? Um, I think his Magnus has, stead, has stated right that his his one his goal or or target would be or is to to try to reach 2,900. Um, I guess he's achieved so much already that uh, he has to kind of raise the bar a little bit, uh, like a high jumper or something. So um, his chances of, of getting there, I mean, uh, well, I don't know, twenty percent or something like that. I don't know what, what other people have said. I don't know. Um, it'd be astron astronomic uh, result, wouldn't it, to have uh, someone to have Magnus reach that level? But you know, uh, as other players' ratings rise, I mean, Ari Resta, for example, uh, with, with a very high rating now, um, he just has to play someone uh, close enough to his rating, and then and then beat him enough times um, to, to to make up that, that difference. So it's anything's possible. I mean, Mag Magnus has achieved everything and more already, hasn't he, in his career? And he's still highly motivated. Um, and, uh, you know, so I think it's great that he sets himself and, and comes out and says, hey, guys, I'm going to try to go for this, you know, and, and, may, and says it and doesn't just keep it to himself. It's, so um, I wish him the greatest uh, luck with that, you know, and hey, why not? You know, it's something for us all to, uh, to speculate on. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I have started this uh, chess uh, podcast recently with uh, with David uh, Howell and um, Magnus joined for a very short episode uh, in episode one and and we asked him about this and then Magnus said that um, I mean he wasn't confident that he would reach that goal but he said that 
just to have that goal itself uh, helped him uh, motivate and focus. And and he had a great tournament in in Tata Steel in yes. uh, in January. Yeah. And that was you know um, just after he he publicly said that uh, this is my next big goal. And right. he he just said that it helped him during that tournament to to both focus and. And to probably go for the win, you know, he beat Caruana with the black pieces in the mm -hmm. in the last round. Mm -hmm. uh, he could have secured uh, the tournament victory with a draw, but I think in in games like that, it motivates him to to uh, yeah to play on and to to try and fight and win every game. Uh, yeah, basically. and also what messages he's sending his rivals when he comes up with something like that and says, "Hey guys, this is what I'm going for." They have, most of them are trying to get to twenty eight hundred, you know. Uh, exactly. And he's saying, "Hey, that's nothing. I'm going for twenty nine, you know." And it, it, I mean, it's not the first time he, he's done that. I remember some years ago he he had already won um, the the super tournament in St. Louis, and uh, he was playing against uh, Levon Aronian in the last round. And I think either Levon uh, made a draw offer, or there were some repetition, and then uh, Magnus just played on and won that game as well. So just right. yes, you know, I remember his, that. Uh, yeah. yeah, shows uh, his uh, yeah his fighting spirit. And actually, wow. We have to um, commend. Uh, wow! Look at that, C six. Hey, Fritzy, you, ha you have the, you have the, you guessed the move. Do we have a prize or something we can send that gentleman? Or I don't know. Um, at least you get a shout out here on the, <laughs> on the podcast. Wow, in impressive. I mean, but I guess we, I mean, we didn't analyze it that much, but it kind of made made more more and more sense because one of Black's issues here is the. The, the setup here and also White's potential uh, pressure with the, the, the Queen and Bishop on F7. So now you have a good um, defender here and also maybe bring the Queen to, to C7 to try and coordinate uh, at some point. Yes, yeah, yeah. I'm surprised he's played it, but, um, you know, but uh, I, th I like what you're saying about C7 for the Queen. Um, but don't forget that this C file is sort of half open. So yeah. we can imagine White developing his Queen's Knight and the bishop coming to a3 and then the rook coming to c1 and your queen on c7 is not sitting very prettily absolutely so i guess maybe at some point uh, black might have to consider trying to play c5 just to open up i don't know it's uh, it's double edged and i mean that's the that's the the thing which has um you can't have everything you know when you, each move has a consequence and uh, you try to achieve something but then obviously uh, your opponent might get some uh, some benefits from that move uh, as well. So uh, it's yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so well, C6. Okay. I mean, uh, look at the look at the clock times. Um, almost an hour extra on the clock for Nils. Yeah. Um, has that happened before in the match? Uh, this is such a big difference in in, in time. Uh, so early in the game. I don't know if we've, we've seen this. Um, yeah, I don't think he's been one hour up. I don't think so. Um, so this just uh, confirms my suspicions that um, yeah, Nils is is more comfortable in this position and probably mm -hmm. more more uh, prepared. And um, maybe now we'll see Nils having a little thinker eh, after this move. Yeah. And I think uh, speaking of that, I think we'll have a very short break uh, to catch a breather, and then uh, we'll be back in uh, a few a few minutes. So stay tuned for this exciting game uh, nine. Okay, see you soon. Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the Geologist. It's non-chess team. So I see it's some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand, and we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. 
Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys for the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind the scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. I don't really know what my expectations were when I grew up. I just wanted to make games. I didn't really consider where that would take me. Today, I am the chief creative officer here at Mojang in Stockholm. We have more than 120 million monthly active users and more than 200 million sold copies of Minecraft. I often get a question on why is Minecraft so successful? I believe it's the way you interact with the world. It's very simple and uh, you have a big impact on just small actions. You quickly realize that you can build anything, so it gives you a very sense of uh, empowerment. <laughs> I came to Mojang because I've always been making games my entire life. Marcus Passion, he created Minecraft and his idea was to create more games with the support of the success of Minecraft. I got asked if I knew someone that could help them develop a new game. I said, well, I volunteer myself. For the first year, it was just me and Marcus working on Minecraft. It was really in the spirit, as we say in the, in the industry, like we were just doing things for fun. Sometimes we could have an idea on, on the Monday that was released on the Friday. So it was very high tempo <laughs> and uh, a lot of fun. When I started, the game had already sold 700,000 copies, uh, which was amazing and more or less unheard of in the, like, in the game scene. We believed that we had peaked but we quickly realized that Minecraft is here to stay. So that meant that I would take over the lead development of the creative vision for Minecraft. I think the most fun part about making games is the early phase where everything is possible. And it's both about creating a world, but also creating the rule sets of this world. When I look around, I always look at things and think about them in terms of game development. <laughs> I'm not sure if it's a, it's a blessing or a curse. For instance, when we were on a holiday in Singapore, and they have these amazing plants that grow on the trees, like flowers. And I was thinking, oh, that, we could use that. <laughs> like, Sweden might be a good place uh, to be a nerd. <laughs> Well, we have these really long, dark winters, uh, so it's not strange if anyone just stays indoors a whole weekend and working on something on their computers. That's potentially one of the reasons why we have so many good music artists uh, and also game developers, and we're, we have the time to really geek out on specific topics. Så vi har ju precis snapshotat lite olika features till Caves Clips, till exempel koppar. Och vi har fått in lite olika feedback, så jag tänkte kolla lite med dig vad du tänker. Today I'm more guiding and directing ideas. And uh, Agnes Larsson is now leading the design team for Minecraft. We know that kids play a lot of Minecraft. So when we add new features, we try to consider if we can make this feature in a way that teaches and something. One of the reasons why we added bees was to put attention to that bees are very important for pollination but also for the way we produce food. And also Minecraft is a fancy world and not everything works as it does in real life obviously. <laughs> When I play Minecraft with my son, I build things and my son, he wants to go on an adventure. <laughs> so he just says, come on dad, come on dad, we need to go. And I was like, okay, I'll follow you. When we're out exploring, I'm more like, oh, can we go back now? <laughs> can, we, can we continue building on, on the castle instead? <laughs> and he's like, no, no dad. <laughs> I'm always thinking about 
what I'm working on next. You never really sit down and say, oh, this is it. It never really ends. <laughs> you just follow your drive. It's time to take control of your journey towards chess mastery. Magnus Carlsen introduces Chessable, the definitive solution for studying chess. Move Trainer uses the science of spaced repetition to identify your strengths and eliminate your weaknesses. There's no need to set up a board, remember which page you're on, or keep track of all the moves you miss. Get started now and join our growing community of over 100,000 chess enthusiasts. Chessable, take control of your journey towards chess mastery.
Welcome back. Uh, we're underway with game, game nine in this uh, special challenge match between David Howell and uh, Nils Brandelius. Uh, before the break, uh, we thought uh, White had a pleasant position, uh, some uh, a small initiative. And after a long think, David actually played uh, C6, which mm. uh, one of the, the viewers on the chat recommended. So, so that was very funny. And um, before we go into the position again, I just want you to rem I want to remind you that we are doing a fundraiser, uh, a joint effort between uh, Chess24 and uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. Uh, we had uh, Tosh Damba uh, yesterday, who's a Norwegian international master and also working for uh, NRC, uh, telling us a little bit about their uh, work and what, uh, what the money will, will go to. So um, there's a QR code here on the broadcast and also a link to the donation site. So if you have the chance to, to donate anything at all, uh, that would be much appreciated. And it goes to, to a great cause in, in a difficult time for, for mm. many people. Yeah. Well, I mean, ask you while we, I mean, I don't, maybe we should maybe make, talk, make a big thing about it on, on what, I mean, we're here to look at the chess, of course, and to enjoy uh, the great chess and the competitive, uh, nature of this but i mean it's pretty shocking what's going on isn't it in, in europe um, and we're sort of here but people are suffering uh yeah i mean absolutely and uh i mean to be to be completely honest i i wasn't expecting to 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 see something like this in europe again in, mm -hmm. in you know in as an adult um so it's it's completely shocking and it's um yeah, it's just a big tragedy uh, for so many millions, millions of people. Uh, That's right. Yeah, around Europe and uh, and and who knows what's 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 next and 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 you know. uh, and of course, just in our little world, the chess world, which I mean, we, it, we're talking about humanitarian uh, crises and everything, and it's, it's awful. People's lives being uh, turned upside down, or or, or, um, or worse, losing their lives. You know. Uh, yeah. But just in the chess world, I mean, we already see, and we don't need, need to sort of take it too far, but already we see uh, decisions, changes, and, and sort of uh, the, the, the pressures, uh, negative pressures, and the negative uh, uh, results of, of what's uh, happening. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, one of my, one of my friends, uh, a Russian chess player, Yevgeny Rumanov, he changed federations now to the Norwegian. Uh, I saw that. Norwegian. Yes, I saw that. And yeah. other Russian players has done the same. Uh, some are now playing under the FIDE flag. And uh, I mean, he was even criticized by, by Karpov, among others, uh, Romanov, because of the, the change of federations. So um, yeah, it's, it's also a bit sad to see, you know, uh, legends of the game uh, supporting what's going on and uh, yeah, mm. uh, dividing, uh, somehow dividing also the, the chess community. Well, that's the thing, isn't it? Because of course, well, we all have, of course, Russian friends, Ukrainian friends, and colleagues, and we all know many, many chess players from those two fine chess nations. I'm given so much to chess, yep. uh, and now it's like the instead of brothers, they're enemies, you know. Uh, and then, you know, most of us are just watching in horror at what's happening, and, and you know, can hardly believe uh, what's what's going on. Um, so imagine how it feels for for those people, um, uh, not just Ukrainians, but also ordinary Russians, also. Uh, um caught up in this yeah absolutely uh, and the, the repercussions will go on i'm afraid and on and on uh, in, in ways that we can't even begin to imagine yeah absolutely. Um, and, so and as you mentioned i mean there are some some yeah some challenges now for you know organizers for feed that um hmm. team events uh we have the olympiad later this year we have the candidates tournament uh where both uh Janne Pomnacci and, and Karyakin are qualified uh, to play. Um, what will happen with the candidates? Um, and and if if uh, some of the players are you know banned from playing, who will mm. who will take their place? Um, I mean, we have all these uh, questions um, that are are yet to be to be answered. And uh, that's right. Yeah. And it's it's going to be very very hard for for FIDE and also for individual organizers. I know some people have already come out and said, "Well, we're not going to do this, we're not going to do that." But but it, it's just um, divisive, isn't it? It just uh, because you're almost forced to say something and do something if you're an organizer or yeah. you're working for yeah, FIDE, I mean, and um, it's you can't just stay in the middle and sort of not not do anything. And I think you know both. Uh, I mean, the Grand Chess Tour, Norway Chess, among others, have 
have said publicly that uh, there are certain uh, players that they will not invite back to their tournaments. And uh, yeah. yeah, so that's how it is. And But what we do know, uh, Stuart, is that uh, the Olympiad will not be played in, in Russia. I guess that's right. public information now. And um, mm -hmm. I mean, there have been some rumors that India might um, go for a, for a bid that's to host, true, yeah. uh, host the Olympiad. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, a great uh, chess nation with uh, so many strong young talents. I mean, I'm I'm so impressed with uh, with India these days. Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. But even there, you see, let's say the Olympiad is held in India, for example, and is held later in the year. Um, what about the Russian team? What about the Ukrainian team? Will both teams be there? And and what about if the Ukrainian team say, "Hey, we're not going to play if these players yeah. are taking part, even under FIDE flag"? Or uh, yeah, I mean, there's all it, kind it, of things there, you know. It would be a bit strange, you know, if let's say Russia has a team and it will be the FIDE team. I mean, basically, if, if they're all playing under the FIDE flag and uh, mm. yeah, it's all just very strange. And I can't imagine uh, if if Russia has a team under the FIDE flag that uh, the Ukrainian players, if they if they decide to, to go to the Olympiad, want to ever play them in a match. So yeah, nice. all these questions. Uh, yeah. That will definitely arise, and uh, I, I have no good solution for this. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it's, I'm afraid uh, that nobody has any solutions. It's, 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 it's really it's above my pay grade, and uh, mm. it's, it's so difficult and delicate situation, and certainly delicate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, just I, know that, I just I mean, that the community, uh, as best we can, you know, stick together and uh, and show solidarity and help the ones who really needs it in, in this difficult time and uh, right. yeah. yeah that's that's my um, my two cents um, yeah well our thoughts are with uh, with as you say with uh, just ordinary people uh, people whose lives are really um, you know yeah absolutely been uh, destroyed in many cases um, by, by what's happening but okay um, to come back to the chess here, so Niels uh, still hasn't moved um, as killed, so uh, yeah. after David's move C6. We've been looking at a few moves, uh, looked at, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess Bishop A3 uh, doesn't really work because of your nice idea of just blocking it with uh, the knight. Well, uh, then of course White would play, um, the game goes on, does it? I mean, there's many yeah. moves that I could play after that. Um, um, you know, such as just developing. I mean, the white needs to develop his queen's knight, doesn't he, at some point? So, um, like why? But what about, let's say white starts with knight b to d2 instead of bishop a3. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, yep. Bishop uh, knight to d2. That, that would be a fairly natural uh, developing move. Um, although the problem is, of course, it shuts up the bishop coming to g5, doesn't it? So it's. Um, yeah. Um, so maybe, maybe we also can look at this move then. Um, but then the question is if if uh, black can go here. Can black go there? Yeah. Maybe maybe not. I think you can. I think you I can. I think I mean both players would just love to have a couple moves now to developing moves to to connect mm -hmm. the rooks and then bring the rooks into the game, uh, perhaps. Um, and as we've mentioned, the black's problem uh, for now is is what to do with the queen and also the, the light squared bishop. Um, so if you had white, if in, if you had white in this position, what what's your couple candidate moves? Um, yeah, well, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not sure anymore because uh, okay, knight bd2. It looks obvious, but don't, what does it, it doesn't actually do anything. Uh, it's just a developing move. Um, and and actually, so, I mean, Nils has played Richard B5. Okay. Yeah, makes All right. a lot of sense. Um, and then the plan, I guess, is to, to bring the knight out afterwards. Yeah, I quite like your move, queen d6 here, uh, as killed. Queen d6. It's, a, it's an annoying pin, so it's just good to maybe, maybe also, you know, have some ideas of trying to. Try and do something uh, at some point. But, uh, that's a bit optimistic. That might work in the Good Night Cafe after. Uh, yeah, after, after a couple of times. 
<laughs> but yeah, I mean, to to get out of the pin makes a lot of sense. And um, I think if Black manages now to develop the the bishop and bring the rook into the game, I think he might be doing okay. But um, still, I would prefer White in this position. Um, Queen D6 looks, uh, it looks fine. It looks okay. Yeah. Um, uh, let's try something else. Just, just for example, let's try moving the bishop somewhere. What about bishop, um, bishop f5? I don't know. But now, now maybe we can play even bishop d6 because we have the pawn on c6. And um, yeah, but maybe, yeah, maybe bishop f5. Well, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't see anything wrong with the, with that move. And I mean, in, in in different lines here, I think both players can can win a pawn. Uh, let's well, say. maybe. But but still, I don't I don't think that's a problem necessarily because I just have the feeling that Black will have. Let's yeah. say. Uh, if take, Black has to give up his bishops, one or two of his bishops. Yeah, I mean, this just this looks and fine. Black won't mind this at all. This looks fine for Black and mm. probably better. Yeah. Mm. No, White won't do this. So, um, yeah, so maybe just develop uh, the bishop and... Uh, and again, it's, it's hard to see a better move than um, knight, knight bd2, really. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, maybe black can play moves like queen d6. Uh, if, if tactically it works, if there's no... Um, because he could also perhaps play queen b4 later. Yeah, that's an interesting, uh, interesting idea. Um, and um, one advantage of the bishop on f5 is it does prevent white from using a rook uh, on the b line. You know, it's just controls yeah. some different squares. That's, uh, that's a good point. Um, but also, I mean, it's it's a bit annoying because uh, if, I mean, I would love to bring the rook to d8 at some point, or maybe this rook, um, then rook c8. But there's this also this pin. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a difficult position to, to kind of uh, both uh, evaluate and, uh, and suggest moves because I feel, yeah, I mean, I feel, I feel white is doing slightly better, but. Um, well, black, black is holding his own. If black can get developed, as, as we've said before, I think, just he needs to square for his queen, to connect his rooks is something uh, that every chess player knows, you know, connect your rooks, get developed. Yeah. And um, black is the player who has difficulties with that. But it seems like he's able to, to solve these, these, uh, these problems in the next couple of moves without any accidents, you know, without something bad happening. Um, so, I, was, I was just thinking, I don't know if it's any good at all, but uh, you actually have the idea maybe to to just swing it over, but it doesn't do. it doesn't, do, it doesn't do much. Uh, just inspired by by Nils's okay. last uh, rook a three. <laughs> and yesterday, uh, yesterday Malcolm was obsessed with rook a two in yesterday's game, so he was so happy when uh, David finally played the uh, hmm. rook a two. Uh, so I mean, yeah. Um, okay. We could see rook a two. Why not? Yeah, we could. It's a way. I mean, it, you know, it's it's just or, or yeah, also bring it to to d two. Because your your knight wants to go to d two. Um, you can also play knight b one to d two and then rook e two and double up the rooks. <laughs> yeah, they the same position, you know. So um, something like this, yeah. Uh, and 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 for black, I mean. If you can develop the bishop now. Um, the thing about bishop e6 is that, that now he's played c6, his knight on d5 has that extra support. And bishop e6 is sort of self pins a little bit because now the knight can't move. Yeah. And I'm not sure the black is the best square for the bishop on e6 now going forward, you know? Yeah, I agree. And, and, and as long as it's not. As long as it's not a big threat to to actually win this pawn in the center, um, I think it's more natural to to play bishop f5. And I could come back to what I said earlier, Askil, about knight b4 and possible things on c2. 
Yeah. You know, with the bishop f5. Uh, let's see. So yeah, bishop f5. This idea to, to yeah, try. I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, just to sort of cause a few um uh a few a few um, difficulties, maybe for, for white. But you know, bishop e6 is a bit more passive, isn't it? Bishop f5 does uh just controls more squares basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um Okay, so uh, yeah, we might see might see this move. Bishop, bishop, f five. Seems uh, natural. I mean, David is down to twenty two minutes now. For um, I mean, right? right. Move, yeah, move this 14. is serious. Um... Move fourteen, uh, twenty two wow. moves, or no, sorry, twenty two minutes for twenty six moves. Plus, is it thirty seconds increments? Yeah. And uh, I mentioned, you know, the other day I was joined by uh, Mikhailo Oleksenko, and he had a very mathematical approach to the time trouble. Mm. And uh, for instance, in this um, in this case for David, so twenty six moves, that's thirteen minutes, thirteen minutes extra. Um, so let's say he then, um, practical speaking, he has uh, thirty four minutes for okay. twenty four moves. That means he cannot spend more than one one minute. 10 seconds, you know, per per move. Hmm. So that was uh, Mikhailov's approach. Uh, if it's a very critical position, okay, maybe you allow yourself to to think for two or three minutes. But he was very adamant that, you know, I have to spend hmm. no more than one minute and then 10, 20 seconds per move, because uh, if not, I will get in severe time trouble. And then you will often put yourself in a difficult uh, position. But you and I both know that David Hall doesn't think uh, that way, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so obviously David has a different approach. But it was it was just uh, it was interesting to that was the first time I actually heard from a a, a strong grandmaster uh, mm -hmm. that this is actually a way to 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 go about it. And um, yeah, I think uh, that's something most chess players they don't. Uh, think about having a, a specific approach to time trouble. Um, yes. they, they're just winging it, you know, and uh, often, the, I mean, I'm a terrible uh, time trouble player in classical chess for some okay. reason. I'm, I'm a good bullet and blitz player, but mm. when I'm low on time in classical, I, I don't I don't have the ability to adapt, you know, to a different pace of the game. And uh, I often, yeah, blunder or just uh, crack oh. under pressure. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, challenging. Well, I think Niels is going to feel pretty pretty good at the moment, don't you? I mean, he's got as we as we keep uh, saying, he's got a big time advantage. He's got a sharp position where he seems to have uh, some initiative, let's say, and uh, the easier game probably uh, of the two to play. And um, well, he's a point down. Let's just remind everyone that he is game down. He lost yesterday. David winning a good game uh, to take the lead by one point. And there's only today and tomorrow left, right? Yeah. Uh, and, and of course, David has white in the last game. Absolutely. So I mean, for David, if he if he gets a draw today, that's a great result for him. Um, I think he would be more than happy to to get a draw today and then finish off uh, the match tomorrow with the white pieces. And uh, okay, I mean, I'm a bit surprised, uh, Stuart. We have a move. I'm very surprised. I'm very Tom, surprised. Tom takes b5. Is the move. Yeah, I'm really. Uh, didn't even consider that as an option. Uh, no, uh, I, I, I mean, as, as I was saying, when the uh, when the gentleman um, asked us on the chat about c6, and I was saying that um, it, it really left it, it for white to decide when to take on c6. That black didn't really want to take on b5, and now David has played that move. Um, it doesn't seem to me consistent with having played c6, but just to take on b5. Um, I may be wrong. I hope I am. I mean, there are a couple of arguments, though, for doing it. I guess, I mean, white cannot really take with the queen because you allow black to develop. No, sorry, <laughs> that doesn't work. Ah, uh, but then queen takes d5. Uh, yeah, yeah, queen takes d5. But, um... <laughs> He'll probably play queen takes b5 now. <laughs> probably. Wow. Okay, so... But this just feels so um, unnatural to be able to take with the queen. But maybe it's. I agree. No, it it does look a bit strange. Um, what other moves? And then I was thinking, if you yeah, if you take with the bishop, then you you don't have the same 
uh, pressure anymore in this diagonal. And um, the only thing though is this um, this pawn on b7, which might be uh, a weakness for. Right. Oh well, I mean this white's extra deep. Yeah, I mean the pawn structure white has this. The, the isolated pawn is, is now past pawn, isn't it? Yeah, pawn on d4 um, for what it's worth. Um, and what about a6, b5, which I think most of us would play um, if, if we had to choose a move quickly? Yeah, that was uh, natural. But maybe David just feels that he's, uh, he's okay now. He plays, um, for example, queen d6, which we've mentioned many times, and uh, completes his developments. And he does have this a5 pawn. Is, it's a pass pawn, and maybe he'll have a tactical uh, tactics with a4 at some point. Yeah. And uh, it's kind of a deflection, you know. And I mean, uh, possibly in an endgame, I mean, that pawn can become um, yes, quite the, a big threat. And uh, if later on, you know, you have time to, to develop, maybe you can even consider going in this diagonal with um, the bishop. I don't know. Ooh. But uh, yeah, so what what do we expect? Which uh, which way to take back in this uh, position? Um, sorry, let me see. After queen b three, so uh, five. yeah, three three different options for for Nils uh, to take back. And uh, and meanwhile, we have a question, uh, a good question from Ed. Um, how much of the time spent is actual calculation, or is it a percentage spent on in indecision about uncalculable outcomes? Another nice philosophical <laughs> question there. Um, yeah. I think. Listen, I mean, uh, if, if we think of being a time trouble addict uh, as, as, as as something undesirable, as something that uh, uh, you should try to avoid, then I think inevitably you have to conclude that some of the time spent is is basic indecision yeah because you know um it's 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 chess is too deep there's too many uh possibilities you can never get to the bottom of a position uh this early in the game really um uh, it's changing move by move and uh so you need to be a practical player you need to be able to accept that you may not find the best move in the position and play a good move Play a sound move. Play a move uh, in, you know, in keeping with the um, with the demands of the position. Uh, let's say so. Um, you know, so, uh, David, of course, is a perfectionist uh, in that way, and um, that's why he doesn't think in the way you described of so many moves to go in so many minutes. Therefore, I have to spend this time on this move. You just try to play the best move and find the, find the best move. So, um, yeah, absolutely, and I mean. We had the young Norwegian uh, international master uh, joining me the other day, and he said, "If you spend more than fifteen twenty minutes on a move, then you start to you know uh, tire yourself out." And his point was that you don't really get uh, it's not easy to get a deeper uh, calculation or a deeper understanding necessarily if you spend you know thirty thirty five minutes compared to 20 minutes but um mm -hmm. i guess it's also a bit individual how you how you approach it but um yeah that was his um that was his uh impression at least i mean of course david is a very fine player i mean he's reached 2700 uh in the past uh, and he may well you know um be able to get back to that level or, or higher i mean who knows um uh, and the same for Niels, you know so um but yeah, it's uh, the thing is how many games. I mean, I I was speaking for myself as well uh, as, as as someone who had problems getting uh, into time pressure too often. How many times do we go back and see a game that we've lost because we made a mistake on move thirty eight, move thirty nine, because we had thirty seconds or ten seconds left even, and you had to make your move and then you choose the wrong one and you blunder and, and then and but you, if you take it back, it was because you spent time on move twelve. You spent mm -hmm. twenty five minutes or something like that, which factors down to move thirty nine. Uh, um, so, yeah. Well, these are things that everyone knows, but it's 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 easy to talk about, but very hard to rectify. If you have that problem, if you tend to spend too long 
in the opening and middle game, it's, it's, it's easy to say, yeah, fix it, but it's very hard to actually fix it. Um, psychologically, I think. Yeah. And um, I mean, many chess players, what's the expression? They are like, uh, you know, habit animals or, uh, you know, they stick to, to their habits both on and off the chessboard, I would say. And, uh, and it's, yeah, as you said, quite difficult to, to make uh, big changes on, on how you approach a, a game or, you know, it's like almost changing parts of your personality and uh, right. we all know that's not very easy uh, to do. Right. Yeah. So, um, well, it's nice that these two players, uh, it's similar strength, almost, almost identical ratings. Yep. And uh, we've had uh, fantastic games. And another one today, in fact, a uh, real uh, contrast in styles as well. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love it. And uh, yeah, the position is getting uh, quite uh, quite inter interesting at the moment. So um... so what about queen takes b5 here, Askel? So we have a quick look at queen takes, because we noticed that bishop d7, uh, yeah. let me just show that, show why bishop d7 is a, is a mistake. Yeah, so the problem with right. this move is queen takes, and when you take back, and there are no tricks. Knight is uh, yeah, captured in the end. Um, so instead of bishop d7, um, does white have a threat here? White threatens, I think, bishop takes d5. Because after queen takes d5, yeah. queen takes b6. So white's threatening something. Let's just make a move. Let's just. Well, you made a move that's probably, it's probably okay. <laughs> Okay, let's make another silly move. Yeah. Okay, and now um, you want to take? Uh, why not? Sure. And then the point is now the queen is no longer defending this pawn. No, bishop, sorry, on, on b6. So um, that's the first way I think to look at any position is, is yeah. my opponent threatening something. So maybe then could we now consider a move like? Bishop e6. I think so. Well, there's all of them. I no, guess I it's all a bit loose because now you have to take here, and then you might be tempted to take here. No, sorry. Okay, then the queen will. Uh... No, no, g takes f6 then. Yeah, you have to take. The other bishop is hanging on d5. Yeah, yeah. So the queen has to 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 look at both of the. But this is also quite... Uh, but that would be okay for black. This one would be okay yeah. for black. You also have the bishop pair, obviously, so... Yeah, this would be fun. That would be a playable. But I think after bishop e6, maybe bishop takes f6 is a bit awkward. If bishop e6, how do you re reply to bishop takes f6? How does black reply? Not sure. Yeah. You might yeah. have to play pawn. Exactly, yeah, you probably have to. Yeah. Bishop takes f6 and then... Well, surely yeah. what is better. Surely what is better. But, uh, yeah, it's uncomfortable. So, uh, so uh, I'm not maybe sure. Maybe I have to find another move for, for black in this position. What about your h6? Maybe then just bishop h4, which is come back. Yeah. Uh, and keep the pin. And um, I don't know. Also, queen d6, I think we said was possible here. Mm -hmm. Interesting that Niels is thinking about his move here, isn't he? He's, um, he's, he's, uh, he must be considering queen 6, b5. But do you think he was a little bit surprised as well that David took on b5? Or Yeah, I'd like to know that. I think, I think he probably is, yeah. I think, um... I think, uh, I think he probably has been surprised. Kind of unnatural to me a little bit to play c6 and then take. Um, so in a way, that's good for David. He's, he's giving Neil something to think about. He's got it. I mean, bishop takes b5 looks very strange. I don't think that's going to happen. But certainly queen 6 is playable and reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, and as you, I think you said um, as well about the structure here, that these black sort of queen side pawn structure, clearly inferior. Um, you know, yeah. without, with we know he doesn't have this past a five pawn anymore, mm -hmm. and um, he's still under pressure. And um, 
So there are reasons, I think, in favor of queen takes b5. So Niels, uh, having a good think? There's a, yeah, I know, there's also some tricks uh, Black has to look, look out for. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think queen takes uh, might be a reasonable move. Um, yeah, and um, and Stuart, we are also joined now by uh, Swedish Grandmaster Pontus Carlson. Oh, and, great! Fantastic. And, uh, yeah, Nils needs some support uh, from his uh, fellow countrymen. So uh, great timing for for Pontus to to join uh, join the show. And uh, yeah, maybe Pontus, uh, Pontus, welcome to the show. Hey, how are you doing? Can you hear us? Yeah, I think he's connecting now, so he'll Next be ready in uh, a few Three. seconds. Yeah, we see Pontus now. But uh, maybe no sound, I don't know. It's tricky with uh, the... hey, yeah, we can hear you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, perfect. How hey, are you? Pontus, how are you doing? Hi. Hey, Stuart. Good to see How's you. Life? Life, is, yeah. life is okay. Life is okay. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Looks like uh, David is doing well, yeah? David is doing well in the match, yeah. You mean this yeah, position? Yeah, in, in, the, in, the, in the match I was talking. In, in this match, game, yeah. of course, Nils has the usual slight advantage, but uh, I'm a bit surprised, actually, that he didn't play anything... Uh, probably he felt that he's getting better positions all the time, but uh, why he doesn't try anything else? No? Because Nils knows a lot of openings, <laughs> really a lot of openings. Nils, yeah. Have you worked with Nils a lot? Have you, if you trained with together? Uh, well, no, throughout the years we have done some things, but uh, I mean, if we're gonna be completely uh, honest, there's one chess professional and one <laughs> hobby player, <laughs> and you can figure out who's who's who. <laughs> Uh, so, so I think that uh, I mean it's uh, Nils uh, has he's worked with uh, uh, like all those guys like Leko and uh, you know all those serious players. So I think he he has he, and also he's worked for Magnus, you know, for for during the World Championship matches and and he's he's known to be very good in openings, you know. So I'm a bit uh, surprised that, that, that the Italian maybe it's the only way, only opening where you can consider some opening advantage. Nowadays, <laughs> but I'm a bit surprised actually why he doesn't try something else as well, you know. Yeah. Especially because David is is I mean he he everyone knows how David plays, you know he's very very solid, but he has you know some problems with time management. Right. What do you think about the last couple of moves here? So in fact, uh, Niels did play Queen takes B five, uh, as skilled, and then Queen D six, which we also which I think was your move, no? Queen D six. Yeah. Just to try and get out of um, the pin, and um, yeah, I mean, seems to hold things together for now, at least. But um, how do you rate the position, Pontus? I think white is a little bit better, but but uh, as always, you know, with e4, e5, uh, you make one move, you know, one slip, and then suddenly it's equal, you know. So yeah. it's uh, I don't think Nils has much much margin, you know. But from so, this and, and the, the other game, uh, I mean, uh, the other Italian game, Nils won uh, two days ago. That was a pretty nice win in, in the same opening. Uh, so yeah, maybe... it, it, it was. It was. You know, I, I, liked, uh, I liked his idea there with Rook A3. You know, because, uh, I mean, he, he needs to, to play a bit more aggressive, I think, you know, just in general, yeah. Yeah, than what he's done in this match. Because... because David is, you know, he's super solid, and and uh, as long as he gets his positions, you know, where not much is going on, you everyone knows he's strong, you know, uh, during long games. Mm. That's uh, that, that's David his loves, thing, you know. He loves long games. The longer he the game, loves it, he loves it. He loves it. He has a he has a very great stamina, you know, and and uh, so he likes those long games, you know. So I I think that uh, you sh you should go for something more complicated, you know, where you can actually use uh, because Neil's time management is much better usually, you know. So I think he could. Uh, I I'm a bit surprised he didn't go for D for some game or yeah, something else because 
He knows that as well. Well, and we spoke uh, about course, that, didn't we, um, Askel? We spoke about maybe Niels, uh, whether he's just purely one E4, whether he can also change some sense. Yeah, and, and my impression is that he is mostly an E4 player, but maybe even, yeah, Pontus probably knows uh, better than me, but uh, yeah, that's the impression I have of him as a player. Yeah, he's recently he has played a lot of B4, yeah? but uh, over the years, you know, he's played everything, and, and he is very flexible, usually. So that's why um, I'm. I'm a bit surprised he doesn't do anything else because I know that he also can play like knight f3 and, and d4 and he has done so successfully. Yeah, so uh, I, beat... at least in this match he's been very consistent with one e4. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe he's I been I... preparing, you know, different um, e4 openings for the match. Well, yeah, he just yeah, played. But... Sorry, go on. Five. I mean, e4, e5 is it's like. When you play with David, you know he's going to play that, you know. So and and everyone knows that it's not the easiest opening to find, you know, some kind of large advantage or something like this, you know. It's it's then it's if you wanna if you have you know try some new and some new ideas, it's I think it's easier if you go for D four or something else, because it's less exploited, I think. You know, the 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 territory there. What do you say, Stuart? Well, I've just wanted to sort of looking at the position we have in front of us. He's just played knight b d two. I mean, the natural um, developing move. I think yeah. um, you know. Look, I mean, all the pieces are on the board. I mean, no, all the major pieces are on the board. Um, it's it, anything could happen. It's, it, White seems to have an easier game to play. I would say, um, lots of uh, you know, uh, lots of pressure. I think that uh, put, put, uh, potential anyway in the position. For things to happen it's quite an exciting game so it's not it's i mean it's sometimes the italian can be lots of maneuvers and small things happening i think today we haven't seen that and um i think neil says you know did you see the opening with c3 and d4 he played very concrete um yeah i, I saw that unfashionable line i think yeah i saw i saw that i saw that but uh i mean he's he's usually very up to date you know when it comes mm. to opening lines and so on because since he's uh both usually an active player and also he's like I said he's been working with Magnus and right. so, so he, he's he usually knows what's topical and uh, and so on but uh, and 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 just, uh, as uh, all three of us I know both players quite well I think that David is uh, the opposite <laughs> when it comes to this you know he's, he's I mean he knows he follows of course because he sees the games and he's doing commentary but it's completely different, I think, to to yes, see the moves and actually check them, and then analyze the lines. You know? mm. So I, and and there I think that David uh, should have a huge disadvantage right. that I think Nils Nils should have used better. Mm. And, and also the the question is, you know, as you said, Pontus, David is working, you know, on the Champions Chess Tour, doing a lot of commentary, and and uh, the question is. Does he feel that he had the motivation or energy to then go home and and you know study chess after you know working yeah. with commentary and and other things? Um, it must be a challenge for him to find that balance between doing commentary and and uh, preparing and studying for for himself. Um, I'm sure. I think sometimes it can help uh, you know his his motivation because he will see some of these uh, new ideas. And then uh, as he's the expert there in the studio, you know. So then he needs to know what's going on. So I'm I'm sure that sometimes when, when he also checks the moves that you know in the games and and the new ideas that that um, people are deploying in those tournaments, you know. So I, I it probably helps him to keep up to date with chess, you know. I would say, but still it's I I mean the way Nils works with chess is is, is much more serious. So I think that then. Um, he should really go for for tough openings and, and and stuff that where David you know needs to prove that he knows the homework. Right. Yeah. And and complicated games. I think uh, uh, I also saw that this was what Magnus said that uh, Nils should have some edge in dynamic uh, complicated games. And I think that's uh, that's true. You know, uh, David is. I think David is is really 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 good. Like many of the, the the best English players, in long games, you know, they they all have quite similar style apart from Gawain and Jones. I would say. I mean, the the McShane and Adams are Adams, of course, is the best. But 
it, it's, you know, it's, it's not very funny when you are in a slightly worse position there against any of the English guys, I would say. I see that David has now increased his move rate. He played bishop d7 pretty fast, and after queen b3, he's played instantly, more or less, bishop b6 to a7, which suggests that he's feeling good about things now. He's feeling a bit more uh, in tune with the position and uh, things that may be okay for him. Yeah, and, and, and finally developing the, um, the bishop on c8 uh, helps a lot connecting the rooks. And um, yeah, I think he's, he's quite happy. Uh, yeah, it's it's it looks like uh, so, you know this kind of. I, I think he's always happy as soon as he gets his e forty five because <laughs> then he's solid. You know, it's it's. Uh, I, I I think he because he has played this for so many years, Stuart. You know. And well, like, okay, but uh, I mean, I don't think I don't think one can stop playing one e four because black has to reply e five. I mean, you have to just. <laughs> that's, that's part of life, you know. You just. Um, but, yeah, it's refuted, you know, it's refuted. You can't play it. <laughs> no, but I mean, you, you caught me quite well there in uh, one time in Liverpool there with D4. Yeah. You're me? I think it's it. Yeah, yeah. Right. You remember right. in Liverpool, yeah, 2009. Oh, Liverpool, there. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So it's, I think, uh, the, you know, this is, uh, there's more things that can go wrong there, I think. That's my opinion. Now, Pontus, tell us a little bit, just quickly, um, your own sort of chess career. Where are you now in terms of... Uh, playing and working at chess are you sort of full-time part-time um uh, well work, chess wise uh, i'm not doing much uh, when it comes to to my own play uh so what i'm doing uh, chess wise is basically uh, the um, business me the non-profit you know the business me chess and kids mm. uh, the, where we use uh, chess to uh, get people together uh, yeah. Just for integration, basically. So we, we have kids from inner city communities mm. and pair them up with uh, business guys. Uh, and we do this in different countries. So Norway, uh, where Askil is also involved, for example. And also in, in the US, you know, in, in uh, we, can have, we have one uh, event coming up in Spain mm. uh, on the 2nd of April, for example. And then, of course, in Sweden as well. Yeah, and we have also a big one coming uh, uh, online event where we're gonna have some kids uh, from uh, really poor backgrounds in Africa. So we are looking now for business guys uh, to join and to play, and it works like this: that you actually the business guys actually sponsor the kids, so they they also can help them with school fees, you know, food, um, shelter, and uh, clothes, so that kind of thing. So it's basically. <laughs> that's the chess that I'm doing right now. The right. social okay. chess mm. is a social tool, you can say. Mm. But uh, playing, uh, oof, it was a long time ago. I, I try to defend myself sometimes in the Czech league, uh, but it's this season I haven't played uh, anything yet. Uh, also, a lot due to Corona, and, and I've been too busy. Yeah. Uh, so with 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 work and so on, and also the non-profit. So I haven't been, yeah, I just haven't had time to play. Do you, miss, do you miss tournaments? Do you miss playing in tournaments? Uh, I mean, it's fun to when you go away and play the tournaments, you know, it's, it's of course it's fun. Uh, and uh, I I enjoyed when we played last time now in Poland, you know, I enjoyed being uh, back in this uh, World uh, Rapid and, and Blitz Championships. I enjoyed playing, but... Uh, uh, of course, it's it's not so easy to to play when you when you don't train. You know, you you need to study. You need to because uh, mm. uh, otherwise you can't defend yourself uh, on that level. Anyway, which comes back to play with, doesn't it? On a different level. Sorry, I yeah, to... yeah. I, I mean, you 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 must be uh, you must be into it, you know. Mm. And um, I uh, for me, I, I in the last three years, I've only played. Uh, the, yeah, that tournament, and I think one more, and that's it. You know? uh, because the Corona also took down my motivation to 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 travel for tournaments and to play something, you know, because there were so many other problems uh, mm. with work and, <laughs> and everything. Uh, mm. Because I'm also an economist, you know, so so that's usually what I'm doing during the days. Right. And uh, it was a lot of things were changing all the time, so you you. you there, there was just no time to to focus and constant, you know, concentrate on 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 traveling to Spain to play like the old days, you know. 
when when we used to play those open tournaments over there it was of course it was lovely but uh, it's not it's not the same you know when you sit there in face mask and <laughs> and uh, with five pcr tests and so on yeah no i was, I was just about to say pontus i met you you know in in poland and uh, you were having a rough time uh, losing a few games and then you were playing you know 2650 2700 players nonetheless but just goes to show how strong that uh, rapid and blitz uh, those events how strong they are and uh, yeah you were um, you yeah were those are super strong super yeah. strong actually i i i think that, that in poland was the worst uh, but of course my shape was really bad so then of course it's really rough tournament because you you i i, I remember i was I was on zero out of four, which I guess never happened in my life. But uh, then I was I was uh, paired with with, with uh, uh, this Bosnian guy, a grandmaster also, with around twenty six hundred <laughs> on last board. We were sitting there, you know, and uh, I was black, of course, as well, you know. So so it could have been zero out of five, you know. But I I managed to get a get a point there, but but it, it was just. Uh, yeah, it, it was quite awful actually, result-wise. But it was a lot of fun because it's good games, you know, and it's it's fun to play. Mm. And uh, I have to say, I mean, one thing uh, the three of us have have in common is obviously the the Gibraltar tournaments. And huh. I think yeah. we met there for the first time many many years ago, uh, Pontus, and uh, became good friends ever since. And uh, yeah, I mean, some of my best friends from the chess community I met at the Gibraltar uh, festival. So. Uh, yeah, that's really nice, you know, looking back. That, uh, How many times, Askel, do you think you came to Gibraltar? How many times? I believe I went probably around 12, 12 years. Wow. Uh, my good friend Odin, he, he went 15 years, that's right, uh, before he, he had to retire. But uh, yeah, so I was thinking yeah, on the way from my hotel today, I was thinking, I, I guess as much as maybe good over 100 different Norwegian chess players has attended. Played uh, in that tournament, yeah. yeah. Over the years, yeah, and maybe even more. Um, I think we always said. I mean, after players from from the UK and from Spain, of course, neighboring country to Gibraltar, then Norway was always more or less. Until we, then, of course, we had lots of Indian players also coming, uh, but Norway was always one of the top four or five countries in terms of numbers of players in Gibraltar, which was fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. and even Magnus, Magnus came twice. Yeah, Magnus came there, and I believe both him and and Boris Boski, uh and at, uh, the tournaments at the same time and yeah you you don't see yeah. that often no so. it's, i mean stuart and brian has done an amazing job over there you know yeah with uh, preparing the tournament you know and uh, it's it's uh it's always a was always a pleasure to come there yeah mm. you, you came what, because... twice three times pontus you came no more more, more. Oh. i've been there i think seven times or something wow. like this in in total uh but of course, it's nothing compared to us, killed and Odin and those real veterans, you know. But uh, I, I really like it, you know. It's very, very nice. Uh, and uh, in the start, you know, when it wasn't so popular, uh, I used to go there with Manuel Berg. Oh, Manuel, uh, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, he's done some good results over there. Mm. Uh, and I, may, I remember, I don't know if you remember this game when he won the beauty prize with the, he, he was basically walking with his king the whole way down to h3 oh, was, kind was, of, one, yeah. mm. was one of those uh games you know where the king is running over uh, the whole board and mm. uh so i think it was uh, was it against ganguly or something i think something like that yeah right. it yeah. was it was a very nice game actually uh like this but um and we, we had some funny stories there you know i remember when we were staying in the caleta and mm -hmm. uh, with all these monkeys, you know, that always yeah. co comes to your room and, and steals mm. your bananas or whatever, mm. yeah. Mm. And we, yeah, had, we had some really, place. yeah, we had some really funny <laughs> episode there with uh, because we actually managed to catch one, uh, one of the monkeys one time. So it it basically came into the room when we were both there, and we had, Emmanuel had bought some bananas, <laughs> and basically the monkey was just looking at us too, you know. And it was looking at the bananas and the bananas was like two meters away or something like this from, from the monkey. And then it just made, you know, it was basically just evaluating the position, checking, you know, this guy's gonna <laughs> take them. And then zoom, 
guess stole the bananas and jumped out of the window and we didn't know what was going on. So it was it was pure evaluation, you know, like like a pure chess player, I have to say, you know, evaluating the, the options. Ah, think before you move. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. It was, can I take those guys? Yeah, they are slow. <laughs> yes, yes, do it. Nice story. So it's, yeah, I yeah, know. I mean, over there, I, I have many... Uh, many good stories, I think, uh, mm. over the years. You know, we 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 really liked it. Well, that's the thing about chess and in general. I mean, particularly Gibraltar tournament, but of course others as well. Where it brings brings people together, uh, professional players, amateur players, people from all over the world, sharing the uh, passion we all have for chess uh, in a positive way. Which, um, of course, we have these terrible events now in Europe, uh, which we mentioned before. Um, and chess is yeah, something yeah. like everything else, like everyone else, you know. Um, yeah, and uh, also even the even during something something so horrible, you know, like like a war, um, you can see the chess players are helping each other, you know, mm -hmm. they they are helping mm -hmm. each other with stay, you know, the, for the the, the poor uh, people that have to to run away from their homes. Yeah, you can see that they are getting helped by other chess players, you know, mm -hmm. and to get into the countries, you know, the the sometimes you can even, you can even get a refugee status, you know. And I get asylum due to a chess club. Mm. So I, I think that the chess world uh, is already helping each other and will uh, do more. Do and we'll continue to do that, you know. Yeah, so true. I think, and, and th that's like a connection, a bond, you know, that you get through, through the chess community, mm. which I think is uh, really good. And I, I see it all the time, you know, in the trade and industry, for example, you know, the business network, you know, the, 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 there it also helps a lot. Right. That that you because a lot of people are chess interested, hmm. and then you 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 already have. A, of course, it's a super advantage to to be a, be a chess grandmaster because then people know you, and uh, you already are like approved. You can say because people ex expect you to be smart, and and so you already you don't have to like uh, you, you basically get uh, you get through this phase where people are like, oh, I don't know you. Who are you? You know. There is no trust. That that phase, uh, you get past that phase, you can say, which which is a really a huge advantage, I would say, also in the trading industry. So I think chess helps uh, many areas, you know, school mm. as well. Also Brings people to get sort of breaks down any barriers, and um, you know, we we always speak. It's like a language that we all speak. Yeah, uh, yeah. Um, no, I think I think it's really good, a good thing. You know, it, it's it's. Uh, so I always encourage people to put their kids like in at least one, two years in chess school and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, maybe they quit. And as you said, uh, you know, the different projects you do, and you can also say that you can, you can use chess as a, a means of building bridges, you know, between people also in difficult times, in difficult situations. And yeah, brings people together. And uh, me and Stuart uh, talked about, you know, how, uh, how the chess community all over the world has come together now and and, and trying to help each other out and uh, and do uh, as best as we can in a very very difficult situation and uh, yeah it's uh, it's important yeah it is uh, yeah. it is it's, it's very important and then how how much has been raised uh, for do, this do you have any bars or any yeah we have um, we've had some technical uh, difficulties unfortunately today but we're close to ten thousand uh, dollars raised for. Uh, the Norwegian Refugee Council. So Tosh Damba was joining yeah. and he's working for the NRC uh, in Norway. And um, yeah, so we're extremely happy with that. Uh, so hopefully uh, the small technical issues will be solved and we will be able to, to raise to show it. Yeah, last yeah. yeah. Uh, and I hope Tosh Tosh was talking a little bit also about he, he and his wife was, was doing with uh, this chest for refugees, which yep. they've done. In Norway for I don't know if it's is it four or five years five years yes, I think so and I think uh, Udin is actually one of the um, volunteers helping out so every Monday night they would uh, gather uh, yeah refugees coming to Oslo and uh, and uh, have chess uh, evenings and chess events and tournaments simuls and uh, yeah bring people together and and uh, they can find a, a community you know uh, through chess. And, and that's what's uh, so great about this game. It's as as you said, Stuart. There's no languages. There's no mm. uh, other barriers that has to be broken down uh, in order to to connect people. And right. it's it's really great. And um, 
yeah, uh, they've done a tremendous job. Um, so, uh, so that's yeah, that's really good. That's important, you know, when you come to a new country and so on, that you you find, you know, either job. Of course, uh, hope, hopefully you find everything, you know, but you you need to find the, you know, either a job or you get into some kind of community, you know, some. Uh, uh, it could be a club, you know, or, or some hobby, you know, some activities, some sports club, you know, you need, you need to meet people and, and find friends. And, and then I think uh, chess club is excellent thing too. And then this kind of uh, evenings and gatherings and so on. Also, because, because it's, it's, it's for all ages, as you say, it's for kids, it's for old people, yeah. elderly people, families, something yeah. that everyone can come together and share. Yeah. And that's also how you like learn the language, you know. Like it's because it's very very important to to get the local based uh, friends when you get to a new country because otherwise you never learn the language good enough. Yeah. Well, so it's 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 really important, you know. To uh, and then uh, all kinds of sport teams and and, and some kind of uh, hobby, you know, it's very very good for that because uh, there you you be meet with with people with similar interests, yeah. and then it's easy of course to to become friends. Yeah, absolutely. And so, so I think, uh, but Norway is also a very interesting country when it comes to this because the you know volunteer work and non-profit work is extremely well developed. I have to say, it's uh, it's quite developed in Sweden as well, but in in Norway it's extremely well developed. They even have a, a specific word uh, for it, which I I learned uh, throughout the years. This do gnad a skill. Yeah. That you, that you use over there, which I, is, I, don't uh, have a good, I don't have a good English word for it. How, how should we try and, and describe it? Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's people coming together. Let's say you live in this um, uh, big apartment building and you have this big backyard. So people would come together, you know, a couple times a year to to move, mow the lawn and, and hmm. you know, you, you're you're coming together to maintain you know the the common areas and and uh, everyone's putting in some type of effort to to make it nice for the the people living there you know and uh, yeah basically a joint effort in 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 doing something um and sometimes it can be you know for a certain group of people or just for a greater good uh mm. so during yeah, the it, pandemic for example you, you said the this is a big duke not people come together because Obviously, we're trying to help each other by acting so and so and doing this and this and uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I, if I managed to. Describe yeah, yeah, this. no, it's, it's it's really not easy to explain. <laughs> but it's some kind of special, specific, voluntary work. You yeah. say. I, I, it's the best I can give in English because it, it's just really because I think in different countries, you know, there are these words that you just can't translate really yeah. mm -hmm. into other languages. Yeah. But I think is this right something, the, sorry, Oscar, uh, sorry, is this something specific now with the refugee crisis and the human, humanitarian crisis in the Ukraine, or is it something in general that applies in Norway and also Sweden? Um, this sort of helping each other out and coming together as a community and uh, helping maybe less advantaged people in society. It's more Norwegian, I would say, uh, than Swedish. Uh, in in Sweden, Sweden, we have volunteer work, which is, uh, but this is this is. Um, it's more developed, I have to say, in Norway. You know, since I'm I'm sometimes moving between the countries, I can compare, and I would I would definitely say it's more developed in Norway. This, you know. And, and to answer your question, I think it it definitely applies in, in general. Um, but, but obviously, when you know big um, crisis occurs, um, the 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 power of let's say mobilization increases, and more people feel the call to actually. Try and make a change and and to contribute and uh, yeah help out as best as best they can. Um, so I mean it's it's yeah it's truly really great to, to see that happening and 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 to be a part of it. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you can say like in Norway they are always prepared to to this. It's like some kind of uh, emergency system they have with this, you know. So when bad things happen, yeah. they, no one has to say anything more or less. It's just okay. What time do we meet up? In Sweden, it, it it doesn't work like that, you know. It, it, people can take responsibility, but then it's always someone who takes an initiative, and does something. 
and then the other ones will, will jump on. You know, in Norway, I don't think they have to say much. Honestly, it's just uh, ingrained in the culture. Mm. And I, I think it might be because of the size a bit as well, that Norwegians uh, have like got used into helping each other because of the size, because it's not a big country. And then it's, I think that before probably been, people really needed to help each other. Right. Like that. Yeah. Because you have the Iceland, for example, is very, very similar. They, they, have, they, they have really similar things. And it's even smaller. So I, I can imagine that uh, it comes from the size a bit. I mean, there are only 300,000 or something, right, living in Iceland. So that makes a lot of sense. Every, everybody knows everybody, basically. And, uh, yeah. and they all play chess. All yeah, play chess. exactly, exactly. Yeah. They, they, they have, have the highest mess. amount of, of grandmasters in the world, you know, uh, compared to uh, per capita. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah still, I think great, the great chess uh, country and, and traditions, obviously. Mm. Uh, yeah. And and what's going on in England right now, Stuart? Chess wise. Chess wise, we have this great match here in London. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> well, th this match we don't like because Sweden is losing. So yeah. <laughs> do we have something else? <laughs> um, I. Um, well, I think sort of um, lots of chess in schools, uh, yeah. lots of uh, initiatives in, in that direction. Um, in terms of major events, also because of COVID as well, of course, but, but even before that, we, we don't have much um, in, in the way of tournaments as, for example, Spain does, um, or France, uh, or Germany, you know, in terms of numbers of events, rated events, of course, there are tournaments, um, but uh, I'm a little bit outside that as well myself. Um, no, no, not up to date with all the latest things, but uh, but you are back in London now. Now I'm back in London, yeah. Now I'm back in yeah. London, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so maybe so I no should try Gibraltar. to organize a few things here, maybe. yeah, yeah, yeah. You should move the Gibraltar, the rock, you have to move the rock to, to London. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we are, we are waiting for the tournament, you know. When, when will it happen? Yeah, Yo, I'll invite you, uh, don't worry, Pontus. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. The is also, I mean, uh, Malcolm Payne who joined the, the broadcast. He's one of the organizers of the match, and he said they're they're now planning uh, a great London Classic uh, event coming up, um, back to normal, hopefully with some of the strongest players in the world. And and also he mentioned this event in the summer, Stuart, at uh, mm. Trafalgar Square. Yeah, that was, was great last year. Yeah. 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 Oh, the brilliant. summer the chess fest uh yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's brilliant uh, over a weekend really that's um yeah it yeah it's a, good pr pr for for chess you know when you can get into the trafalgar square sure yeah. but it must be you know it's it has to be malcolm or someone to pull that well, malcolm's because... brilliant at this i mean he did a fantastic job yeah, uh, yeah. He, and he it does, does a fantastic job you know um, yeah, yeah. He, he does because I, I know the regulations over there in the U, UK, so it must have been a complete nightmare, you know, with, with uh, securing the Trafalgar Square and so on. I think he has a date already for this year. He told us, uh, as yeah, as, uh, yeah well, was it seven? Yeah. Sorry, 17th of um, of July, I believe. 17th, M might have been, I, I'm not sure, but July uh, 17th, yeah. Uh, oh, but it, it was a huge success, as uh, from uh, what I understood last time. Mm. Uh, so it, it's, it's great. There it goes on, you know. It was some kind of live uh, board, I remember, with some actors and. There was a live, yeah. There was some actors. Well, right, Alice in Wonderland. Yes. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was very, very hot. I think it was the hottest day of the year as well here in in London. So it was extremely hot. Yeah, there was someone who passed out uh, <laughs> from 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 the heat. You know, the heat. one of the actors. Yeah, one of the actors. I think it was from yeah. the, the uh, passed out from the heat. All kind of things oh. for kids, uh, symbols and uh, rapid games, bits games, uh, and presentations of this and that, all to do with chess. And um, that was really good. Really so nice. Stuart, t tell me one thing. You know, of all the the, the players, the, you know, the old chess legends and everyone who came to Gibraltar, who's your favorite? Who, who, which all the one legends. Most... Why? <sighs> who came and played? I mean, if it's who came, of course. Boris Fast. Yeah, yeah, because I'm, I'm not names. exactly it's so, someone who came and played, you know, not, not someone who has to visit because of well, I had so many names. I mean, uh, I mean, Victor Korchner came uh, two or three times yeah. to Gibraltar and played. Uh, what, what an honor to have him at, at, at your tournament. Um, and some great moments with him. Um, uh, for example, beating Fabiano, that was a game that went around the world. Yeah, yeah that, 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 was, that was a brilliant with this G5. Yeah, I remember, remember that. Yeah, you, maybe you were there that year. Yeah, yeah, no, I played, I played with Fabiano as well. 
Uh, mm. So so in, in Gibraltar. Yeah. And uh, that was also a funny story because basically I, I, I was staying then at, on the Spanish side at my friend's place, Enrique. So I was staying there with, and, and I think Enrique beats Odin. I think he's played every year. Oh, I know Enrique. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Osuna. Osuna. Osuna I, think Vega, yes, played, I, know him, yeah. I think he's played every year. He also played every year, correct. Yeah. yeah, since he started. So he beats Odin with uh, five five years or something like this. Right? He's played every year. So so he, he uh, I was staying at his place and, and uh, you know, there's, there is some culture differences, you can say, with the, the Spanish culture. There is a, they're not always the best to come in, to be there on time, you know. So basically, I was going to play the record Victor and mm -hmm. I really didn't want to be late for the game because, of course, it's also with Victor and he's not very nice if you are late you know, either. So, and also it's, it's like an insult to come late to get such a player. So, so therefore, I remember that Enrique came out in morning coach, you know, like five minutes before we were supposed to go. And he told me, he's only like, yeah, today we will be quite late. And I was like, oh. <laughs> you know, but I, I was going with him, so I couldn't do much, you know, because I I, it's, I couldn't walk, you know, it didn't go faster. So I just had to wait for the car, you know, and, and then uh, so I was almost a half an hour late, you know. For the uh, game, play Victor, you played yes, Victor. Yes, I was he almost a half been, an hour. He must have been furious with you. He wasn't happy if I put it that way. And and you know when I so I, when I arrived like uh, you know twenty eight minutes late, he just looked at me like, <laughs> and I said, "Oh, sorry, Victor, I'm really sorry." And then 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 we played uh, so, some uh, uh, some some moves, you know. We, we just we just played, and, and I was of course younger back then. Mm -hmm. so he, he was he was muttering something, like, mumbling something about oh these youths <laughs> or something like this, you know, when I approached, when I came to the board and then we played some fast moves and I was a bit stressed because I was, you know, so I was a half an hour behind the time as well. So I blitzed out the moves, uh, which he also did, but I actually mixed up the move border in, in some Queens India. So I just did the, the wrong move at the wrong time. And then the guy looked at me again <laughs> And he did E4, you know, which you are not supposed to, to do there. Basically taking the whole center and my position was just complete disaster after the seven moves. <laughs> and I was like, oh, Jesus Christ, what is this? So, so, and then, but then actually I managed to, to trick him, you know, but it of course cost a lot of time. So I was actually winning then after that. Mm. And then um, he, he, he started to play he started to throw all the pieces and he, he took the clock into to, to his knee more or less and just pushed it to, to stress me you know but but since you know as you know when it was victor you know you you, you always allowed much more than with other players yeah. because and so so of course i didn't say anything you know but then in the end it was actually i, I misplayed in the time travel so it was actually a draw but i didn't want to draw so then I thought I saw a really good move, which sacrificed the rook, uh, and I thought that it was winning. But then I, I missed one thing, of course, so it was actually losing, you know? And then suddenly he has stopped with all this, uh, what he was doing before, and completely quiet and calm. And then he took my rook and he, he told me, don't be late to the game. <laughs> and, and that was... <laughs> And then we had a nice analysis and everything like after, you know, because when he wins, he, he was usually very nice. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's when you beat him that you can have mm -hmm. other problems. <laughs> but but a very, it was, I mean, this guy, he, he, he was so strong, uh, even when he was around 80, you know, he was still yeah. an extremely strong player. So, Complete well, I mean, yeah, just the chance to play someone like that, even if you lose... Uh, badly or, or you know the game doesn't go great to be able to play a legend like that yeah you, no no victory yeah, is very I mean, yes. it's uh, yeah, that, special yeah, exactly and also the after the analysis after the game yeah. was really interesting you know because mm -hmm. he knows so much as you know but it's always like this when you sit down with like you know Ivanchuk or Gelfand or, mm -hmm. or those guys you know the, I was about the, to say the... Ivanchuk was the other name I was going to give. Maybe we should come back to the chess set. But Vasily yeah, Ivanchuk, yeah. another player who's been to Gibraltar many times and a great uh, a friend of mine, a great guy. I love him very much. And uh, I think everyone has uh, a high regard for, for Vasily Ivanchuk. 
and uh, for his jazz and also for him, for who he is, you know, and, and how he is, you know. Great character and, and uh, tremendous player. But we do have a couple of moves, so let's just see what... Um, so in this position, after a very long think, uh, Nils played uh, uh, the knight to e4, um, which of course is uh, perhaps some, um, some trades here. Uh, David took on e4, and then Nils took on uh, d5 with the bishop. Interesting. Okay, we didn't really, we weren't studying the position, but this is... Um... So this is the current position, and yeah, uh, yeah David, David to move. Um, looks like he has to take on g5, or are there other... Mm -hmm. yeah, well, I mean, that, then, then it gets really messy, you know, because you have both f7, and uh, so I, I think also knight f6 must uh, also be a move, no? Back. Just go back calmly, but of course you get a lot of pressure with knight e5 uh, coming. Maybe rook d1. Well, bishop c4. Or what do you say? Stuart? What do you do here? Bishop c4. After knight f6, bishop c4 looks um, sure. Or do you take on f6 and play knight d5? I, uh, I'm not sure. You can also take on f6 now and play knight e5 now or something like this. You could do. With uh, with really? some pressure, but uh, I I think yeah. Why not bishop takes d4 here? What happens? Bishop takes d4. Complicated. Yeah, f2. I don't know. Well, Queen takes f2. King h1. Bishop takes a1. Sure. Ah, this is is this good for black? Yeah. It may it may be good for black. Yeah. Because you have uh, you get. To get this uh, imbalance there with the pieces against uh, the rook. But what would happen after bishop? Just bishop back to c4 after knight f6. Yeah, uh, just keep the pressure. Um, what do we do? Like in the bishop c6 or? Yes, bishop c6, no? Yeah, or maybe rook e8 or something. Bishop c6, okay. I was thinking yes to to. Hmm. All right. Yeah. Okay. Because but it's actually, not so, so so clear what White is actually doing. You know? Actually, yeah. David took took the bishop. Um, on did take. All right. Very concrete. Uh, yeah. So now, obviously, White has some. Uh, well, this is not the end of the game if he loses this pawn. Eh? It's um. Yeah. No. This is um, as we said earlier in the game. I think. In some variations, both of the players can can be a pawn down, but have great mm. great compensation for that pawn. Um, but I guess it's a bigger problem if, if he loses the pawn on on f7. So um, so here he has to to find some. Um... But this is really sharp as well. Uh, it's like uh, sometimes when you play in a match, you know, you can get. Uh, you get quite tired towards the end of the match as well, mm -hmm. so you can easily make some some really stupid uh, mistakes in the end that you usually don't do. I mean, we saw this with Nepo, for example, in the the World Championship match. He, he completely collapsed because the, the match the match is a bit different than than mm -hmm. a tournament. You know, you you if the opponent gets into your head like like Magnus managed to do on Nepo, then <laughs> it can easily go go really wrong very very quickly yeah so well, probably the, the the tension and the uh the stakes were so high there and every, the whole atmosphere i mean and the build-up and everything the training camps that both players and their teams must have gone through sort of builds up to such a pressure point that when you know the first decisive game of that match it, uh, it's, it's had such a big impact and the way that magnus won that game as well you know yeah, yeah, it was was really a David game, <laughs> extremely long, <laughs> and like you're playing forever, you know, it's some kind of uh, end games, and then it is. But it was an interesting game. I mean, that game, but of course, it had uh, serious consequences for Nepo. But here too, I, I like what you said, uh, Pontus, about uh, if you get inside someone else's head, the, in a match situation, you're playing each other. Okay, here, um, it's going to be uh, ten games against each other with one only one free day. It, it's okay, there's not as much at stake, but the um, and not the pressure of a world championship match, but still, you know, nobody wants to lose. And uh, Niels wants to do the best he can, and he's would very much like to win today. Um, so there is a yeah, lot of because him, the him, him is a lot of stake, yeah. and also for David, you know. 
Of course, of course. And also last uh, the last game, for example, Nils is black, yeah? He's black tomorrow. Yeah, that's also not a very nice situation in a must-win game against David. Because mm. David is very, very solid. So I, I think he needs to, to, to find something. Uh, and he's trying, you know. You can really see how the way he plays, so, what, what position he goes for and so on. He's really trying. You know? So what should but, Niels do here, do you think, Pontus? What, what should White do here? Well, it's difficult because I... I think David has a good, good, solid position. I mean, mm. he probably will, will go with some might F3 uh, in the end, no? Because there is no no, no uh, tactics or anything that works, no? It doesn't work anything, no? No. Or was there something? Let me see. Let me see. What, what happens, actually, if, if you go uh, if you go back? If, if you take on, on F7, what happens? I was thinking with the knight, probably. Six. Yeah, but then you take on f7 and on b7, yeah? Then you win, Let's yeah. see. Right. But, and then on b7, no? This, this wins for white. So this doesn't work, I think. Mm. But if, I think probably they take on yes on d4, no? But I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, this, sure. uh, this is yeah, this, this, this was this, this was what I thought was very, and this, this for a human, you know, it's very, it looks very shaky. <laughs> yeah, but but it's uh, I think it's probably the only way to play for black. You just ignore, you know, the pin and everything. I guess we have some perpetual here, sorts. Well, yeah, but, uh, yeah, Nils. Hoping to find a better control. So knight takes f7 is actually an in interesting move, yeah? Because then black has to find bishop takes d4. Yep. Well, David has probably calculated this, you know? He's probably seen this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think he has a choice. So, so he must go for it. And anyway, because the, other, other, the easy thing here is that the other line clearly loses. Hmm. So I don't, I, I don't think he will miss it. And so on, but uh, it looks, yeah, it looks, looks interesting. So uh, probably knight f3 will come in some kind of. Uh... So, so let's just look again. If knight takes f7, bishop takes d4. Yeah. So obviously, well, not obviously, but if white plays rook a2, then you take on f7, right? I guess now you can take. Or not. Uh, there's no bishop or anything that hangs if you exchange queens and ah there is always some bishop c3 or something like this now and there's yeah no i was thinking on, on queen takes f7 but uh there is always some bishop. just rook f8 no just play rook f8 yeah, yeah. this this low this looks and the a2 and okay a2 yeah i was thinking this looks solid so and if you exchange queens, then there is always some bishop move. Because rook d1 now, bishop b6, or there's a, otherwise bishop c3, there's always something. Could be something, yeah, yeah. So, right. so you, you can't really. Mm. Or, or wait now, what about rook d2 there? If you take uh, king, rook d2. Yeah. This is actually. A... You go here, you just take. Yeah. Mm. Hmm. So probably the best is bishop takes a4, because then there is there's no danger for black. I just put the bishop on c6. And then just keep this position, yeah. 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 Should be. Mm -hmm. Then black can, can't lose this. Agreed, yeah. Uh, so it looks solid, but uh, uh, solid is probably wrong word. <laughs> but it looks okay. Looks uh, looks nice. And I guess the question is, if, if Nils cannot take on f7, then it's, it seems a bit difficult to keep up keep up the pressure here. Because if yeah, he has to, no, I, I he has to he, go back he, to f3, yeah, it just goes yeah. a bit. He has to go back and, and hope for some, some kind of pressure. But to me, it looks like uh, David has equalized. You know? mm. It looks... Uh, and then time-wise, he's, he's doing very well, I would say, with... From David's perspective, he's yeah. only like a couple of minutes behind. So, mm. so 
I think it's. Uh, but uh, I understood that Niels was actually wanted to have an even faster time control, and David wanted an even more classical, slower one. <laughs> but so, it's interesting uh, that they had a different time control for the first five games. Is that right, uh, yeah. Astrid? Or yeah, correct. And and I have to I have to admit that you know they, uh, Niels told me the other way the other day that you know. We cannot play seven-hour games. This is uh, too long, you know. So <laughs> they certainly have the different uh, preferences when it comes to come to the time control. So I basically think that they negotiated. So half the match uh, it will be David's time control, and then <laughs> the other half will be Nils's uh, time control. Amazing. So um, yeah. Okay, but we have a move, and he actually took on F7. Took on F7. Well. Okay, now it's now it's going to get sharp. Pontus, so congratulations! Is, uh... You found the move. Yeah, exactly. Then let's see if we, the problem is that you need to find a couple of more moves after it. So uh, I think David will take on d4 quite quite Bishop quick. Because, yeah, because I mean, the, you know, for a human, there is also this knight e5 and all those lines to calculate as well, you know. Mm -hmm. So it, it is uh, because knight e5, I suppose it doesn't work uh, because queen takes a f2 and bishop takes a1 in the end. But it's still super tense, no? With this, uh, check this line with knight e5 here. It's, it's actually very. After bishop takes d4? Yeah, exactly. And I'll take on d7. Here. Yeah, take on d7. And then uh, you take on f2, yeah. And then take on a1, no? That's, mm. that's why it doesn't work. So it's why this is lost, yeah. Why is this lost? I think. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Have one. Sure. So yeah. But all this, you know, you you need to. Of course, it's it's not super difficult to see it, but uh, he needs to see it. It's. Uh... But why doesn't have that many choices after Bishop takes d4? No. Oh, yeah. well, what was it like? Rook a2. Mm. Rook a2. Probably. Uh, probably then, that's the move. Then you could take on f7, right? It's just the line yeah. is so, isn't it? Yeah. Exactly. Maybe that, that's, you know, after this, with rook d2, is what will happen. Yeah, maybe mm. we'll have this, posi uh, this position. And, uh, because, I mean, that's equal. Right. And bishop c6. I mean, th this is going to be a draw. Mm. And Nils actually lost one game like this uh, when we played with the nat national team there. Uh, he lost against uh, Salem. Very, very typical. Uh, it was some kind of green felt uh, where he had exactly the same configuration. And you know this when you go on too long, when you, you really just refuse to, to, to take the draw, which which you should take because you want to win and there's nothing, you know. You got these positions where you really, you can't, yes, can't win. So I remember he lost, it was very similar to that, that position. And Ivan Sokolov told, uh, also said this uh, some years ago that this is a strong player, but he has a weakness, and that's that he doesn't stop when when you when you have to stop, you know, mm. in those positions where where there is a draw, he just goes on and tries, you know, and then when you try too much, you actually lose. I think all of us has done this game, you know. Yeah, where you are like, sure. <laughs> and you just, and so at some moment you just realize, oh. Jesus, what have I done? <laughs> and that, 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 that's not very pleasant when you get this, uh, <laughs> you realize what you're actually done there. And uh, mm. David found the bishop takes d4, so... Okay, yeah. good. I mean, it, I think this looks promising for David in, in terms of at least... Uh, at least making a draw. Making a draw today, which... Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think he's playing he, with he the white black pieces and, and the match situation. I think he'll be nice. very happy with a draw today. Um, yeah, no, I I, I think that position that we saw there with with the bishop, uh, that, that's uh, I will I would tell that it's more dangerous for for white than, than for anyone else. Yeah, that that's because you can easily you have to stop uh, very soon there, you know, to play for the win. And, and yeah. if you don't, then you're gonna end up uh, in problems. Very fine balance there, yeah. What would happen and, if and White brought his sorry if White brought his knight back to e4? Though I don't think it's fair. It's particularly uh, good, but you know, knight check and then knight e4. Is that knight check on g5? Say or d6? Oh, yeah. 
king, and then knight c4. Is there any, and then just to defend f2, try to, and then mm -hmm. is there any um, any points in this? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a move, uh, and it's an, an ID. And the question is uh, whether, because th this is really complex as well. So, of course, you can take on f2 as well, but uh, yeah, you have to. Yeah. Well, then king king moves, I guess. Calculate if you get out, and, and this is uh, this is where you are very happy that you're not playing, <laughs> because then you can make all kinds of mistakes. <laughs> because here, here you can easily hang a piece yeah? <laughs> from from both sides, actually. Because <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what queen move there is the best now. If it's uh, h4 or 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 even d4, if you can be so. But no, you, feel sure. black, you feel black should be fine here if he finds the right miss. Yeah, black, black, black definitely is, is fine here. Uh, better, I would say, if he finds the right moves. Mm. Okay, but he did play rook a2, so um, yeah. might lead to this this variation that we looked at. Um... Well, he played rook a3, uh, didn't he? He played rook a3 a couple of days ago. Yeah. Now he's played rook a2. Yeah, I think rook a2 was more successful because you can actually swing it to the king side. This exactly. one uh, is a much more defensive move. So, but it's uh, I think now if David finds through rook takes f7, is there anything else there? Ah, can you okay. take on? Nah, he's played, he's played something else. Yeah, he played uh, bishop c6. Mm -hmm. And he played it quickly. Yeah? Well, he doesn't have much time left as well. You just want to get rid of that black queen, yeah, so you can perform this smothered mate, yeah, <laughs> on the kick. Uh, so Nils is definitely hoping for bishop takes c6, queen takes c6. Yeah, we can show that. Uh... That's nice. That's nice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he is really hoping that someone will fall for this, you know. Yeah, this you never know, you never know. Always a good feeling to, to get that uh, mate in when you're playing, but uh, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately it only happens online, yeah. <laughs> but, so I guess here it just takes back with the form. I think that's the problem, that's the problem. But then you can get Stuart's maneuver here, the, the knight back to e4. You ho you're hoping yeah. that you are, you are you're gonna win a long end game there on, game, on uh, the, the pawn continue. structure, mm. but uh, unfortunately the bishop is tends to be quite strong in this position. Very good, isn't it? So I I think if anyone is better, it's black. Mm. But at least he has the queen and knight to play on. You know? At least something. True. Yeah. But I I don't trust it. So I think that Nils best is probably to go for. Tomorrow's game. Try to uh, just make some draw here and and uh, is there any draw? Maybe there isn't. How do you make how do you make a draw? Here? Well, I don't think he's going to make a quick draw now. Surely he's going to try. To... Ah, yeah, you can. You, you but, no, but maybe he can just can he take now? Yeah, he can take I guess, and then there are some tricks. And yeah, then you go for checkmate. Yeah. Uh, no? So the yes, rook f8, no? This is the move. Look at these bishops. Mm. I think this is really bad, yeah? Uh, well, I don't know. Maybe. Mm, okay, maybe. Yeah, could be. Because f2, how do you defend f2? But you know, I, I just don't think the Niels is going to try to repeat moves here. I'm sure he that's the last thing on his mind. Yeah, he's, he's going to try. But uh, I think it's hard to try I now. I mean, he could bring the knight back to f3 uh, as well as e4. Yeah, something like this is probably what he needs to do. Bring it back to f3. Looks like, like you can, there you can play on. And then try to, to you know, play on the, the squares, the light squares there. Like some kind of, uh, you know, this Torre uh, London kind of uh, game. 
where uh, you try to get the right configuration with the queen and knight, and then you really try okay. to work against the queen. Which move number was this uh, after bishop c6? 22. Yeah, so they're both, I mean, quite low on time. And um, yeah, while, while Nils is thinking now, uh, maybe we should just have a quick break to, to catch up. Um, and we'll catch up after the break uh, when the when the players are approaching uh, time trouble. Um, so I think it's uh, yeah, it's it's now it starts to get really interesting. Yeah, so we'll just have a, a quick break, a couple of minutes, and uh, we'll be back uh, for the the time trouble. Sounds good. never before seen gourmet concept shaped over millions of years featuring 100% natural ingredients and four Michelin starred chefs so put on your best clothes shine your shoes and get ready because you're going to Sweden the biggest gourmet restaurant in the world. That's right, we have turned our whole country into a restaurant. You see, here in Sweden, fine dining is just around the corner, in our nature, and everyone is invited. Together with our star chefs, we have composed a do-it-yourself menu from ingredients that you can forage in our forests fields and lakes. To make it easier for you to experience what our nature has to offer, we have placed tables and cooking kits in a few pretty nice spots around the country. Reserve your seat at visitsweden.com. If it's fully booked, don't worry. There's another 100 million acres of fine do-it-yourself dining available for you. Always close, always open. Simple, healthy, and delicious. Welcome to Sweden, the edible country. I moved away from the city 13 years ago. I worked as a journalist, I studied in university, but there was a sense of longing towards something a bit more real where I could actually create things and, and uh, be much closer to nature. I'm a vegan farmer. That's a bit unusual, but uh, that's what I am. It's a long story. I used to be one of those people that thought that veganism is impossible, very deeply entrenched in, in like the small scale uh, animal farming uh, community. You know, I was a leading proponent for keeping pigs and, and doing animal husbandry, but with a human uh, touch. Well, as our business grew, our farm expanded and our shop started selling more and more meat and eggs and milk. It felt less as I was doing something good for the animals and more and more as I was just showing a happy face for uh, any kind of animal product consumption. It felt like I was a poster boy for, for the animal industry in itself. So I, I, uh, that didn't feel so good, to be honest. So we're picking for the bags, and it's 15 bags. It makes uh, about three kilos, just a little bit extra to be sure. I came across veganism on YouTube, actually, and um, a lot of the things they were saying started to make a lot of sense. The first year or so was really difficult. I made a lot of enemies, unfortunately, because most of my friends were also farmers with animals on their farm. 
And when I started posting on Facebook that I was a vegan and I was against killing animals and all that stuff, and that wasn't too popular with my farmer friends. <laughs> There were just so many questions also that we had to answer. What are you going to eat instead? It's not easy to make a dietary change, but it's even more difficult to make a change in a farm. Our whole infrastructure, everything we had on the farm, was based around animals. We sold the animals, uh, took down all the fencing, we tore down the animal houses. Uh, and uh, if you don't have animals, you still have to uh, produce something on your farm, obviously, and we put a lot of effort into growing different beans and legumes. There's enormous potential in switching from animal uh, agriculture into vegan agriculture, purely from an efficiency uh, viewpoint. You know, if you grow one hectare of beans and uh, compare that to one hectare of uh, grass for sheep, you will find that the beans produce, I think it's up to 10 times as many calories on the same amount of land. Animals aren't a very efficient way often to produce food, you know. You, your food kind of takes a, an extra way through the animal, you know. You grow grains, you give them to the animal, and then you eat the animal, you lose a lot on the way. Instead, if you grow grains and make that into a product that's eaten directly by humans, you know, you're just taking a shortcut and, and being more efficient also. We're approaching nine billion people here on the planet. We need to be more efficient with the land we already have. And I think yeah, going into vegan farming, that will be one of the most important steps we can take. Welcome back to game nine of this uh, challenge match between Nils Cornelius and David Howell, played here in uh, London at the Swedish Embassy. And um, before the break, we tried to find some um, some good attacking chances for Nils, but we, we kind of failed to see anything that would give him a clear advantage, uh, at least. So we had a couple of moves. Nils took on C6. David took back with the palm, and then Nils played the... Uh... Yeah, it is Stuart's ID. I think yeah. he penalty E5. I think he penalty E5. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Well, he yeah. came to F3. Yeah. And then uh, Knight back to F3 to, yeah. to cover for the, the pawn on F2. And uh, yeah, this is the this is the current position. And uh, David has just played Rook A to B8. Yeah. Well, what do we think about this? Uh, black uh, certainly over the worst. Maybe black is absolutely fine, and uh, yeah, why not? I think it's very, very equal position, you know. That, but uh, black is doing well, uh, but I mean, match-wise, because he has a draw is a very good result for for yes David, I think. But uh, of course, white also has something, you know, this queen and knight combination. Maybe, you know, you know this classical mm. stuff when you start to play like a, this is a typical thing if you exchange off the rooks, and then you can start you know to play a bit on those squares. You just need to improve the king a little bit, and then the knight is just better than the bishop. But um, I think David is too experienced, uh, so I think uh, I, I don't think he loses this. And he has active play. The bishop is active. He has the b file. The rook can come to b4 maybe. Um, you know, it's it's okay for black. No, it's safe and it's active. Yeah. And also, you sh even if, uh, you know, you remove the C-pawn, it's not a winning position for white. So I think that uh, as long as, as David doesn't do any big mistakes, um, mm. I don't think he will lose this. Mm. But, but he's got course... four, about four minutes to go, but it's not, also, it's not too complicated, is it? I mean, of course, there's plenty of play in the position, but it's not complex in the way that a middle game could be. Oh, and they have 15 moves now they have to make now in those four minutes. And yeah. then they get 15 seconds yeah, in this game? Oh, 30 seconds per move. So um, 
Is it is it thirty seconds? Because so they changed because it said that uh, the last games they will only be fifteen seconds. In, oh, okay, uh, sorry. Maybe yeah. Maybe they have only fifteen seconds in, in the second half. Okay, then it's okay. maybe a bit, bit more critical for for David. But so did they they get more time after move forty? Yeah, they get thirty minutes. After thirty minutes after forty. Yeah. So they get 30 minutes there, but also only 15 seconds increment, I think, if, if they haven't changed uh, from what I saw. And then, uh, so, I mean, though, that's also a little bit different, you know, is it 15 and 30 seconds? Because 15 seconds increment is nothing that you are used to either. You know? mm. yeah, I mean, there is no tournament that I know about with 15 seconds increment. Do we know if that's what they have after move 40? Is it, uh, can you confirm that? Um... I will. I'll, I'll have to double check, but I will um, definitely find out. Interesting. I I, I think you're right, uh, Pontus. A 15 second increment is certainly very unusual. Yeah, it's very unusual. You know, so it's some kind of uh, match compromised. Uh, yeah. I probably David probably wanted these old days, you know, with, with uh, two and a half hours on, <laughs> on <Yeah. laughs> 30 moves or 20 moves or something like this, you know. And when the games were sealed, you know, like they're really, really old days. Mm. And Neil said, no, let's play some Blitz games. And then probably this is what yeah. he got. Okay. Hard negotiations. Yeah. Yeah. You know, at the Swedish embassy, there's hard negotiations. <laughs> Ask you, I guess there are no spectators, really. You know, the public aren't allowed to go and watch the games. Uh, yeah. No. Um, yeah. Just the two of them um, sitting in this lovely room at the, at the embassy. Um, and the arbiter, no? It's also yeah, there. And an arbiter, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's also, since it's an embassy, then of course also they can't probably allow anyone to enter. I wonder if an embassy, any embassy, has ever hosted a chess match before of this level or any level, really. I mean, a serious match. Um, I don't know. Not, not that well, I know. Yeah, there was something in the Icelandic embassy. Um, so they they played in, uh, in, I think also in the Swedish embassy in Reykjavik. They also played uh, something hmm. because there 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 is a of course like always there is some ambassadors. So there is one ambassador uh, who actually used to be a party leader. Uh, his name is Vokan Juholt, and he's now the um, Swedish ambassador in South Africa. And he has hosted some big chess and schools event in uh, his embassy. Uh, so there are some ambassadors that are very keen into chess. So I know that he, he and when he was in Iceland, he also hosted some match and, mm. and something like this. So there, yes. there, are, there are some guys who are, are trying. Mm. And we have a couple and of moves um, after Rook B8. Mills played uh, Queen D3 and now Peculiar move. Uh, David played bishop uh, b2. Wow. Trapping the rook on a2. <laughs> wow. Very interesting. This is an interesting move. Very interesting move, actually. He's kind of threatening queen f7, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> That's a dangerous move, oh. you know? <laughs> It's a really dangerous move, especially in time travel, you know? Blooming time travel, mm -hmm. less, a little bit annoying. Play. Probably rook e2 or something like this is the right move, no? Just uh, something solid, rook e2. Well, then e2. maybe rook d8 or something? <clears throat> yeah. Oh, you're going for mate. Mm. Nice. Probably queen c2 is better than rook d2. Just uh, calmly. Yeah, the queen should be there, I think. Okay, but what does that threaten? Anything? No, nothing. It's just against queen f7, so you don't lose mm. the, the rook, and you keep an eye on the c-pawn. Yes. And I, I think that maybe now you can prepare rook e2 or something. Maybe rook b4, I don't know. It's, uh... My rook b4? Uh, looks... Not sure. Not sure. I think black rook should be very... Very solid, I think. Mm. I think it's not going to be easy for for. for Neil and in fact, uh, by the way, David has more time than Niels now. I just noticed. Wow. Oh, something must be wrong. 
No, but this, this, this definitely says something about uh, the development in the game, I believe. And uh, Nil seemed to have a quite pleasant position out of the opening, but now I think David is definitely over the worst. Uh... He's played Queen C2. Yeah, Queen C2. Yeah, it's a typical move that you play Queen C2 because uh, it's just you don't risk anything, and it, it's just. Uh... May uh, I think it makes sense to put it there. Sure, defends f2 as well. Yeah. Yes, it's, um... And in time travel, you just want to defend everything. Oh, he played with me four. Hey, Pontus, it's yeah. making a few look. Good. Yeah, time. we are exactly. <laughs> finding the moves. <laughs> Very good. Uh, yeah. Uh, I like this queen and my knight combination. So Stuart likes the bishop. So it can... <laughs> <laughs> It's but it's difficult to see how Nils can can become active. Um, no, I, I mean he he probably will do rook rookie four maybe or rookie rookie two something like this. Rookie four could maybe be a move. Hmm. He needs he needs to get in. I think what what he will try to do is to exchange off the both pair of rooks. And then he's gonna work with the queen and knight, you know, against the, 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 the because his pawn structure is better. And that's what he's gonna work with. If rookie four, what about maybe queen g6? Is that uh, dangerous? Oof. Oof. Ouch. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. not very nice. So probably rookie two, you have to, and then the rookie mm. four was not a good idea. So this is. Uh, and Nils oh. under two minutes now on the clock. So what do you do? Rook B1? Or I mean what do you do? You need somehow you need to get out of this. Uh, yeah, Mar game. Mario on the chat uh, suggested uh, rook b1 just to try and uh... maybe David could play Queen C3 at some point, you know, even here, maybe yeah, queen, yeah exactly, exactly. back rank ideas, tricks. Maybe. Yeah, you can't. Nils played, um... but probably that's what what Okay, it's not really what Nils wants, but he, he needs some kind of uh, something like that. You know, he needs to exchange off some pieces, right? So he can st start to to work on the c pawn. So Nils played h uh, three, which uh, makes mm -hmm. uh, makes sense. Mm. Get some air for the king, so no back yeah. rank uh, threats incoming. But still, I mean. It's difficult for Nils to to get the the knight into the game. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, he needs he needs some exchange. He needs to like exchange of some of the rooks or or something like this, you know, so he can start to to put some pressure. And David playing fast as well, with confidence. Uh, maybe he thinks, yeah. yeah, I could even win this game. You know, I mean, uh... yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a very pleasant uh, position to have. From David's side, because uh, he knows that Nils needs to win, and uh, if he go, you know, over, if, if he's over pressing or anything like this, you know, if, <laughs> then then he can decide the match. Very interesting. This bishop b two move, wasn't it, that David played? Yeah, surprising. Yeah, it's it's just like an uh, interesting idea, but he's really going for it. Because now he, he he must do something like rook b1, no? Because otherwise this queen f7 is coming, no? Ah, there might be some knight g5. He's got knight g5. That's right. He's got yeah. knight g5. So he doesn't need to bother yet. So maybe, yeah. I mean, this is interesting. Nils down to 40 seconds. Wow. Goodness me. He did rook e4. He played it. Mm -hmm. But now it's a little bit different, you know? So queen g6 is not a good idea because then you have yeah. rook b4. Mm. So you need to find something else here. This I like this rookie for move. It looks nice. Yeah. Well, like you said, Pontus, White wants to exchange at least one pair of rooks. Yeah. To, uh... 
And there is there's always this 95 also, I mean, uh, because otherwise that's an important resource that uh, if it takes on e4 mm. uh, and queen f7, for example, there is always knight g5. So yes. your, the rook on a2 is not lost. Maybe David could just play h6 here. Yeah. Let's keep everything balanced. And now he's threatening this, no? With uh, queen f7. And if rook b4, rook b4, and just um, keep this bishop on b2. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, li I like this this move, you know, bishop b2 is. Uh, I totally agree with this. It's a funny move to spice things up, you know. Yeah. That's what Norwegians will, will, will call a grandmaster move. In, in Norwegian, uh, this bishop, uh, bishop b2. Hmm. Um, yeah, it's a strong move, actually. I, I like it. It's like, uh, it's really, you're really asking some, some questions to white. Yeah. yeah. And this is also not so easy to, to always answer those questions with one minute or half 30 seconds or whatever it is on the clock. And also, I mean, exactly this psychologically, suddenly white has to be careful, doesn't he? I mean, he can't just play anything. Yeah, no. exactly. And that's always, uh, you know, this change of scenery is always uh, tricky in chess. Mm. Like, especially uh, because you know this, you know, when you have been pressuring for the whole game and suddenly you have to defend, you know, it's, yeah. it's very easy to, to, to lose patience. I think Magnus is extremely good in this. That uh, I've seen some games, you know, when he plays Blitz with Icaro, for example, on chess.com or something like this, you know, in those matches where, where he has defense and defense and defense, and Icaro gets super frustrated and he has to, in the end, you know, loses uh, something and, and loses the game, you know, and mm. you can really, really, you can really feel his frustration, you know, how, how annoyed he is with one minus defense. So I think. Uh, just to, def to, to be very tenuous in, in the defense, it's, it's really, really annoying. Especially when you play fast, you know, with, with low, low on time and so on. And now they're both down to one minute, so um, yeah. I expect some... Uh, some action. Some action now. Uh, still 11, yeah, 10, 11 moves to go until the time control. I was about to blunder with black. I was about to say maybe black could try rook b3, but of course white just takes it with his queen. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah that's, uh... I mean, this, this is a good point, Stuart. So maybe David should go for h6. Well, you know, as, as Niels played h3 a few moves ago. Yeah. Yeah. It does make a lot of sense. And um... the b3 is my uh, that's a blunder. Right. Ah, but it, I mean, when you, you have two human in place, then then always, you know, the blunders are are always around the corner. It's. Uh, I can imagine yeah. Victor Korsnoy taking your rook on b3 and saying, <laughs> "Well, it, well, it, 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 yeah, exactly. It was more or less like this. <laughs> it was 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 similar." To uh, did he play it? So, so, uh, so he took. Yeah, no, he played h6 yeah. and and Nils, uh Changed. Yeah. yeah, this makes a lot of sense. The, the problem for Nils now is that he can't really move. Yeah? Uh, how, how do you? Yeah, I mean, if, if you try and, and activate the queen somehow, let's say queen here. Yeah, queen f7 or queen e6 is coming. So I think this is, uh, this is not uh, no improvement at least. What about so trying to get the not... knight to d3 or somewhere like that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, no. I mean, this I goes to show that it's still a very tricky position. Mm. Because knight e1, you can't do directly because of oh, queen e6. Queen e6 yeah. wins. Yeah. Queen e6, yeah. and then you win the rook. You know, nasty. The rook to... So you check, and then yeah. queen e5. So it's, very nasty. It's... Yeah, so you need to probably play king f1 or something first, Oof. but then we are into, uh, I can't believe that white can be better or anything like this. He's played knight d2, is he? 
Yeah, 92. Mm -hmm. So trying to and get the knight to c4, yeah. Yeah, this is a good good pair. So he's trying to to just play classical on the uh, on the light squares. And you know he has some knight f1 to block. For example, queen e6 doesn't work because after rook b2 check knight f4 blocks. You know. Yeah. Things like that. Mm -hmm. That's a good extra tactical resource. Yeah, I mean, if black is, a, he has the better structure, you know. So if black does something, uh, you exchange off the rooks. Black does something. There is not very, you know, some c five or something like this. Then you can easily be in a lost position. So I think the queen and knight is always. Uh, it's a good combo to have. And maybe that's uh, that's why David offers to yeah trade the queens with the queen c3. Yeah. Sensible, I think, yeah. I mean, a draw suits him down to ground. He's got this lovely rook on b4. I mean... Um, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because yeah, you, you, you can't avoid this, I think, yeah? You have to... I mean, either exchange or, or queen f5, or mm. to go for, but this, this is, uh, must be the right way to play. And the question is, what is Nils going to do now? Because I think Black uh, is doing very well. The C-pawn is going to start to roll, yeah? Yes. So I, I think this is a draw. Yeah, maybe I have think... to go back, back to f1. Uh, but then the knight is really passive, like rook b. You can, we can go even go for the eighth pawn if you do that, you know, like rook b1 and rook c2 bishop, uh, b4 or something. Rook takes c6, rook a1. Yeah, it's unpleasant. Yeah, it's unpleasant for Nils. So I don't, I, I don't think you can do this. I think knight, knight f3 uh, is the move. But I think black is very very fine here. Okay, but this is this is interesting. This king is f1. King f1. I was so, going to say actually, king f1 yeah. maybe yeah, because the rook ending looks like a draw. Yeah, but this is a this is a direct draw, yeah. If it takes on on d2, no, it's just a complete draw directly and take here and then rook c2. Sure. It's it's just yeah. 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 Uh, then we, they're we going for. This. We might see this in a couple moves if David. Is, is happy. Well, I, I think David will play this. Hmm. I would be surprised if he goes for some, if he wants to play on here. I mean, he he's maybe ah no, I, he, it would be really stupid from the match situation to play on here. And it's a perfect result. I mean, David would be delighted yeah. with it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 No, this, this this is a direct draw, so it's gonna be a draw. And then, uh, so what do we see in the last game? What is David going to play? D4? <laughs> yeah, David plays a D4. D5. He plays C5, yeah. D5 in this position. And, I mean, so he's going to do, do one D4, yeah? Probably in the last game to avoid... Uh, well, the English C4. Uh, yeah, he's played a bit of this kind of stuff. So knight f3, you know, and, and some solid stuff. Because I think he's trying to avoid Nils uh, Sicilian and those stuff. Because he's he's quite well prepared there. But uh, and also I think against one e4 it's easier for Black to get some play than it than it is against uh, some really solid stuff there. Okay, so we have uh, rook d5. He will take on a4 and it's a draw. And yeah. But um, and, and what are the the price sums? Uh, how does it work, Askil? The winner yeah, so gets. So so the the sponsor of the match wanted to encourage uh, fighting, attacking chess. And as we can see, they have now uh, agreed uh, a draw uh, after yeah. 
up the rook takes a4. Um, yeah. yeah, so uh, just to, to mention the prizes, uh, uh, the, if you win a game, you get 1,500 pounds. Uh, if it's a draw, both players get uh, 500 pounds. And if you lose, you get 200 pounds. So, uh, so it's to incentivize, you know, players going for the win uh, in every game. And uh, I mean, we've seen some great games fighting draws. Uh, even though we had a few draws, it's been uh, no boring short draws uh, by all means. So, um, yeah, some really no. exciting, yeah, exciting chess. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, it's it's, it's uh, two fighting players. You know? mm. So it's I mean so sometimes now when you you see the. Uh, you know, because it's it's new times. You know, I have to say because the the top players before, do you remember when Kasparov and Swan, you know, when they used to play like uh, two times per year or something like this? Yeah. It was like, oh, Kasparov is playing. You know, it's Linares or something. <laughs> or or when we played, you know, this uh, European Club Cup, uh, when when you actually could play with Kasparov. You know, mm-hmm. and this, but it was very very rare. That you, you you got to play with the, the top guys. Uh, now they play all the time. <laughs> they play like every week, you know. And, well, online, and, uh, online they do, yes. Yeah, yeah, they play, they play, they play like all the time. You know? I, it's it's like a constant, constant action. And then um, these games, you know, that they play sometimes in those Grand Chess Tour and so on, you know, it's, it's quite ridiculous to see, you know, because they they I've seen this when they go back to back. So they play first in Romania, they make a draw, you know, a very well-known draw, and then they play the same well-known draw, the same players, you know, in, in, uh, like a uh, couple of days later in Paris. You know? I mean, what, what is this, you know? I think in, in all other sports, it would be, you know, match-fixing, because it, it's, it's ridiculous, you know? So I think it's very nice to see this, you know, when... when we have some different players, you know, that, that sure. are maybe not top ten, and and they're, they're really fighting, really going for it, you know. Mm-hmm. So I would like to encourage all kinds of um, tournaments, you know, of the close tournaments and so on, to yes. invite David or or, or Nils or, or or you know another guy who's hmm. number fifty five on the list instead of you know just go after a rating list and 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 you see this uh, <laughs> kind of drawing, you know, if. Uh, where uh, I remember this Rajapo was saying that uh, he didn't have time to prepare, but okay, don't accept the invitation and <laughs> stay at home and prepare. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's just, I find it sick to see this, you know, that they, you can go uh, and and because there's so many other players, you know. That just, below, just below that strength. Just yeah, yes. Below, just below, get I mean, the opportunities. Exactly. Then, I, mean, uh, I mean, I have to say, Pontus, I agree with you, and and that's what we've done now on on the Champions Chess Tour, for example. The first event was a great success. We had a good mix of, of players. Uh, obviously, Magnus and Pomniachi were playing, but also uh, up and coming players, uh, twenty six hundred plus, and we also incentivized because in the the preliminaries they also play for money in each game in the preliminaries. Uh, so then they get seven hundred and fifty dollars per win. And uh, yeah, we had uh, we had a draw percentage of 27, which is extremely low when you when you see a field of players where all are rated above 2600. I mean, it's incredible. Yeah. You don't see that, you don't see those numbers almost anywhere. So so I, I agree with you, and, and uh, I love to see fighting chess, uh, no short uh, draws, and yeah. Yeah, no, I think this is something important, you know, and the the, the... The tournaments need the chess world needs to do something about this because and and the the reason i mean the, the actions that i think is not that you have so fair rules or whatever different rules the, the, what you need to do about it is that you just invite different players so that you, you, you instead of watching this you know uh, rajab of uh, kayakin or whatever it is the, the same draw <laughs> two times or you know you can watch something else for example, I mean, in, in the first event we had now in uh, in February, Eric Hansen, you know, this famous uh, chess yeah. streamer, he managed yeah. to qualify for the knockouts. And before the tournament, I mean, uh, we have a very, uh, we have a focus now on, on statistics and, and they gave him, I don't know, one to two percent to qualify. So you also love, you know, those underdog stories also in chess, you know, where they can compete and, and beat the higher rated players and uh, 
I think he beat both Magnus and Jan Nepomniachtchik, Eric Hansen, in that uh, event. Yeah, so, of course, of course. I mean, it's also interesting for the audience to see some different faces, you know, some different yeah, players, yeah. and also the, then they have their fan base, you know. Uh, so yeah. when you have Eric Hansen, for example, you have we have probably another hundred thousand people that suddenly considers to watch the, the you know, the stream. <laughs> and and so on. So uh, I think it's 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 just smart, you know, from from all kinds of perspectives to to mix the, the players a bit, you know, and and not uh, obey this rating list, you know. That's I probably like it's... yeah, it's probably like I mean, other sports as well. If you're always going to be seeing uh, Manchester United versus Real Madrid or something in a final, I mean, how many times can you watch them? Do you know what I mean? The underdogs, yeah. the outside teams, or the slightly the number two, three teams from it's it, it makes it that sport, right? Of course, of course. I mean, uh, you got, exactly. You know, I remember this when Mourinho won Champions League with Porto, for example. You know, mm. I think yeah, a lot of people that were, are not Porto fans were rooting for them because they were complete underdogs to everyone. You know? mm. And and uh, back then they didn't even have. Uh, I mean, I remember like the whole team was you know one of Manchester United's Ferguson's players, <laughs> and then to see like this. You know, when they managed to knock out Mourinho, Mourinho's team managed to knock out Ferguson, and uh, you know, people like the stories when 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 the under, underdog can do something, you know. Cool. And and I think it's a way to to also raise the interest, you know, into into everything, and and then you have more people watching it, more interest, you know, cool. because you, I honestly really don't want to see you know that that kind of uh, you know those Berlin draws or whatever it is uh, this green felt where they, they can see three bishop d2 and queen somewhere and bishop c1 and uh, you know we have seen those mm. and I think all all grandmasters can play this you know if, if it's so easy to play in this tournament you know you and me Stuart can go and play next time we, we just prepare the draws there and, and yeah. then we go and play you know? mm. so so the it I think it's um they, they, they must do something Mm. Absolutely, yeah. and uh, I think we will be joined by the players soon. So, uh, so um, Pontus, you are free to go anytime uh, you want to, and enjoy sunny Spain. Uh, I will, I will, I will. Thank it's you. Been and, a pleasure uh, having you on the broadcast. Thank you for bringing some insight. And uh, Pontus, you're looking great. You're looking well, my friends. The same, Stuart. The same, Stuart. You know, you. This, this is. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, thanks for having me, Askil. And uh, I hope that uh, Nils and uh, David can produce one last fighting game. I'm sure they will. I'm sure they will. Yeah, uh, Malcolm as well. Hi, Malcolm. Malcolm is here. Malcolm Payne. Hi, Hi. Great Great job. Great job. This is going to be my last words. Great job with the match, you know. It's exciting to watch it. So have a a good last game and take care, guys. Thanks, Thanks Paltis. Speak soon, now. Yeah? Yeah, should be good. Okay, sure. Thanks. Bye. It was interesting to hear from Pontus about the ambassador in South Africa doing stuff. Because I know mm-hmm. I've seen about that. I've seen all about that. It's great. Her ambassador, she doesn't really know chess very well, um, but her son and her father are very into it. Mm, yeah. Uh, which is really, which is really nice. Um, I just wanted to tell everyone that tomorrow, as well as the last game of this match, uh, we've also got the varsity match, which is the, one of the longest running chess matches. If the, the not longest running chess match between Oxford and Cambridge University will also the moves will also appear on Chess Twenty Four, oh, and that's yeah. uh, also starting a little bit. I think it starts a little bit earlier than this match, um, which is starting again at two PM UK, three PM Central Europe. I think the varsity match starts a little bit before, so you can get even more chess in if you feel like it. Uh, an extra hour, great. Yeah. Yep. yeah. I, I Mal- Malcolm, is that at the RAC club? Is that at the RAC club? That will be in its traditional venue of the RAC club. Most beautiful, beautiful building. If anyone's ever in London, to get a chance to to come and see it, they uh, it's so lovely that they filmed part of Downton Abbey there. Uh, it's that you know, it's it's such a, a lovely old traditional building on Pall Mall. Mind you, so is the uh, the ambassador's residence, as you can see from the pictures of the library. But if you go upstairs, oh, honestly, it's such a beautiful house. It's clearly it's, it, it was in, it's in what is an incredibly wealthy area of London, but what's been a very wealthy area of London for hundreds of years. <laughs> it's a gorgeous place. Gorgeous, gorgeous place. So I thought that David was probably pushing at the end, right? I mean, yeah. Neil's had to bail out a little bit, right? In the I end. Think so. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, clearly there was some potential. I mean, if David's king had got into the middle or something, um, 
then Niels would have had a problem, but which I guess it just wasn't, he couldn't organize it. Um, but yeah, no, that was interesting. There was a critical moment, wasn't there, when he went knight e4, he could maybe do something else, right? Mm. Is, that, is that right? Yeah, we were surprised, but we hadn't, we hadn't focused on that move knight e4. You uh, know, it's, it's a strange thing, because I was in the room at the time, and I was looking at it, and I thought, this feels better for white. And I thought, knight e4, very logical, because it undermines d5. And then I walked out of the room. But looking at it more closely, actually didn't, didn't get anything at all. But it's very attractive, isn't it? You see, wow, I'm taking on f7, and you sort of, I don't know, I'm very, I'm incredibly lazy at, when I'm playing chess. I, I just sort of think, oh, well, if I take you on f7, there's got to be something. <laughs> but there, was, there wasn't anything, was there? Is that right? Or the computer didn't yeah, I mean, anything? It, it was just equal. So I think right. uh, David uh, found this very good uh, bishop takes d4 and right. basically solves all his, all his problems. Well, well, it, well, I mean, what it does is it says, actually, I know it this looks terrible, but I'm just getting on with my stuff. Yep. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, you, and then suddenly with white time yeah. to, to consider all the black pieces target, targeting f2. And f2, yeah. yeah. I thought that was a crucial point, actually. When when I realized that black, oh, excuse me, white had to go knight f3 and knight e5 back to f3, for me, that was it. He couldn't get an advantage because if the pressure on f2 was preventing him, if, if one can get his knight to c4 and stably, then okay, he can maybe be better in some circumstances. You know, if he could organize knight c4, king h1, f3, then he can play like Pontus was trying to say with the queen and knight against the queen and bishop. But if he can't stabilize, um, if I may just go com completely Mihai Mihail Marin uh, yeah. on this matter, if he, can't, if he can't make it stable, then... I, I guess he just has no advantage, yeah. yeah. And, then, and then it felt uncomfortable. It felt like he had to find the best moves to, to make the draw. Um, but, you know, earlier in the game, Mark, I mean, it felt like uh, Niels did have something, some edge that was... Uh, yes. He had an easier game to play, quite active. Yes, um, when was... David played c6, it looked a bit ropey to me. Yeah, no, I mean, maybe instead of knight e4, maybe knight e5, I think, might have been possible. And then you can maybe go knight e4 next, and it'll be stronger. I don't know what the the the, the beast said, but but I, that that would be a moment worth checking out again and yep. asking them when they come. Absolutely, uh, I, I would I would I would quiz them on that because I mean I, I say I, I assessed it and got it completely wrong as well. But when I thought about it afterwards, I thought well okay, given that that's not good, given that this feels better for white, what could it be? So maybe ninety five is definitely. Is a move, so, uh, yeah, we'll check we'll it will be interesting to to hear. The players inside as yeah. always and uh, some critical moments in this game as well yeah so we'll be um we're, we're, we've uh, we're going to be publishing on the twitter feed the amount of prize money that they've won so far okay uh because to remind viewers of course there's extra prize money if you win mm -hmm. decisive games are encouraged by virtue of the structure of the prize fund i think at the moment david's got five and a half thousand and neil's won four and a half or something like that yeah uh, i'm not sure that includes today's game uh but uh uh, something uh, given that there's only, I wonder. I was thinking actually what I was going to do, but I won't do it now. But I'll make a confession on air. If uh, if Niels had won this game, I was going to chuck some extra prize money in for the winner of the match, mm. just mm. to spice up tomorrow. But mm. you know, it wouldn't be fair now because uh, Niels can't win the match. So uh, I, that would have been interesting. That would have yeah. been fun. Yeah, yeah. But I was yeah. I was thinking I was toying with you. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Entertaining the idea. <laughs> Great. Oh well, I'll leave you to wait for the players yep. to come. Uh, that was really interesting, and I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing the analysis of that position. And also, actually, the question of whether C7 to C6 was good or not, because it looked. I wonder. Good. I wonder. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. See you later. Good stuff. See you see tomorrow. You. Bye. Thanks, Malcolm. Yeah. All right, Stuart. So yeah, the players yeah. will be here any any moment now. So um, yeah. I will uh, I will give up my two lovely chairs and uh, have them seated and maybe you can just go quickly through. Uh, sure, by all means, uh, happy okay. to. Yeah, and okay. uh, so they'll make the moves. They'll they'll obviously have yeah. the game in front of them. They can. Uh, they, they have the, the the game here, and I mean I have to have to compliment both of them because win lose draw both of them come you know to the chess shop after the games and. And uh, give some, yeah, some insights to 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 their uh, to their games, and it's always tough, especially when you lose, you know, to yeah. do interviews or you know press conferences and, and stuff like that. But yeah, they're both uh, two gentlemen, and uh, happy to, yeah. to share 
from the Very much. Right. And that's much, much appreciated. Um, and that's where we learn things as well about the game that we would have missed and people watching wouldn't have uh, wouldn't have maybe picked up on. So it's it's very uh, revealing, isn't it? Uh, yeah. The, you know, the post game conferences. And uh, as I mentioned, I mean, I had a talk with Nils after yesterday's game, and and obviously he was very disappointed having lost that game. But at the same time, he said, "Okay, this is this is something I can learn a lot from uh, losing this game." And he also said, "You know, I was." He, he he simply misjudged the position, and and you don't see that often. You, you know, players at that strength. Uh, some sometimes you know they blunder, but to to, to just com completely misjudge a position, uh, obviously he can he can take a lot from that game and know what to improve on uh, later on. So, hmm. all right, the players are here, I believe. All right, have a seat. I'm joined by Stuart, so he will. Have a quick run through it for the game with you guys. So this time I have the the game, so you have to. Okay. Uh, so you can lose. Uh, hey Stuart, how are you doing? Hi David. Hi, Hi Niels. Hi Stuart. Hi. Hey, great game, guys. <laughs> and, uh, very nice to uh, to watch and. Uh, well, maybe you could take us through the game on the on the screens here, and uh, yeah. we can. Um, we can hear your thoughts. Um, yeah. Yeah. First of all, as usual, I got surprised in the opening. And <laughs> yeah, it was a bit funny because last game I played D3, Castle, and Rookie One. Yeah. Yeah. And then this, game, this time I decided to do it one move before. Yeah. I... But, but it's completely different because in the other line, there is the move Knight G4, but it's rather uh, risky it's for, for Black. Super sharp. But here, Knight G4 is definitely the best move. So. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It crossed my mind and then I thought. <laughs> but I thought it was quite smart because in the last game, you probably checked it afterwards, like uh, 94 is possible, but it's a bit risky. I, I, <laughs> and then I did it in, in the opposite version. So. It's too sharp. For me. No, the I point is, of course, yeah, I'm, I'm saving on, on D3 here. So it's. I, I have... can't take any four. I was wondering, David, Knight takes C4. I don't know the theory. It's been like minutes thinking. Yeah, but I, I was help. intending D4. Are oh, you take on D4? I wasn't sure if it should be. I like this, yeah. Just I thought in the worst case I can probably take and play uh, okay, like I this. This was some deep prep, and I mean this here I get b5 and yeah. it's active. Right? That's so why I thought maybe I'll put the bishop on b5. Ah, you can put the bishop on this. I didn't see. <laughs> I didn't before, see at all. Ah, bishop before maybe. Uh, yeah, yeah. I was just thinking of the game. I was just scared I would get hit somehow with some. Yeah, yeah, that's the hope of course. Yeah. Rookie four, d5, bishop b5, or something, but I didn't really see it. And yeah. I, I, yeah. let you, I let you bluff me, basically. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but anyway, no, but it's of course very scary to take an e4. Like, yeah. Niels, can I ask you, did you prepare this for today, this variation? Did you prepare yeah, yeah. this for today? <laughs> That's the way you know, it's never clear if I'm mixing up or not. So. <laughs> Maybe it's. Uh... That's the problem with the Italian opening, there's too many movements. Maybe I prepared the e6, c3 shortcut. Maybe this was my intention to get it like this. I don't know. <laughs> Couldn't get it. I simply mixed up. That's a bit. Uh, we uh, it. It's a bit embarrassing. If Knight takes e4, it's good for black here. <laughs> I should have just played it. Maybe you should just have taken. Yeah, <laughs> just pawn up after eight moves with black. No, I don't know. Anyway, yes. we got this. Uh, this line. No, no. This definitely I checked uh, at least. But now I'm just a tempo down on something. Exactly. Exactly. Like either you play a6. Yeah. Where the bishop is normally on a7 rather than b6, so you're tempo down, or you go here, and then I go d4 in one move, and again I'm tempo up. So, uh, yeah, I was super depressed at this point, Stuart. I was, yeah, like, wow, how did I lose a tempo in the opening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, if I go knight g6, like bd2 or something, I wasn't sure. Yeah, like bd2 is a move, h3 was more. Yeah, I mean, we'll get something similar to the game, but I wasn't sure my knight belongs in g6. Exactly, exactly. And I don't think I can keep attention forever. I thought you might trade and play bishop g4, David, here. Yeah, bishop g4 as well. Uh, bishop g4 as well, yeah. This... And just wait with d5 a little bit, you know? Yeah. This really is reminiscent of some uh, anti-Berlin lines. Yeah, it's similar to anti-Berlin. But, uh, yeah, I'm not entirely yeah, so sure how, <laughs> how well it works. But maybe it's possible. Yeah, maybe it's a slightly better version. Maybe. I mean, the reason, <laughs> one of the reasons I wasn't sure is because after the night, Bishop should be fired. Exactly. Uh, uh, even after Bishop XF3, GF3, I wasn't sure about this. Yeah. Mm. 
unless they can go something with d5 very quickly. Yeah, otherwise, one, one exactly, later. exactly. I mean, it could be it could be very bad for back quite quickly. Like the computer will say everything fine, but mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah, maybe bishop g4 is yeah, possible. Yeah. A d5, mm. h. That's just a bit uncomfortable for black. Just got the one. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The bishop is very bad on d6, and uh, all my pieces are very active, but. Eventually, the bishop will get back into the game. <laughs> David, there was a big, there was a big difference in the clock times round about here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, big difference. Yeah, I was. My whole strategy today was to play much quicker, and then, and then I got this opening. So, I mean, it was, it was a bit scary. Um, I mean, the the only good thing is that actually, when I played c6, there I spent a long, long time. You did. But, um, I pretty much calculated the line even with the knight in f7, just because it's. At least I was able to pick the next moves. Oh, so you predicted what came in the game, more or less? Yeah, yeah. Because it's all very natural, like white goes bishop five, which is probably just turns to one. After that, it becomes yeah, quite cool. So. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, but bishop g five is definitely the most natural move. I think. Mm. Now you took it. Surprised me a bit, but yeah. I was surprised. Uh, I was surprised you took that. Uh, yeah, if I if I don't take, then I always have to watch out for the b6 bishop after b. Yeah, it's hard to make a move, basically. If um, I go back to c7 with my bishop, then suddenly no pressure on d4. Yeah, yeah. If I go back to a7, there's always going to be b6 ideas later. Yeah, bishop so a7 just... is very strange to play. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, and I can't play queen d6 here without trying some moves. Exactly, which looks quite dubious. Yeah. yeah so, uh, yeah, no, it, it, wasn't, makes sense. it wasn't what I wanted to do. It's just. Uh, Sure, yeah. no, no, understands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Process of elimination. But of course, yeah, this is an important choice how to recapture because right. I can also take with the pawn. So this is a little bit anti positional, but I'm winning some time. Like, yeah, I don't have to go back and forth with my, my queen. Yeah, and here, you know, I see the arrows with seven, but. What were you planning here, David? Queen d6? Maybe queen d6 anyway. And basically, just. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least now I hint at queen b4. I mean, which is quite annoying in some lines. And yes. Seven and, un and similar to the game. Um, then I think. Like this, yeah? Yeah. I mean, maybe now 94 or 95. It's Something, still, yeah, maybe. Still very You don't have the c6 square as well. Yeah? That makes yeah. some difference. This is um, That's not ideal. Hard to say, yeah? Yeah, it's hard to. Maybe moves like rook, rook e5, is it possible? No. Yeah, rook e5, d4. I don't know. Yeah, bishop takes d4. Mm. <laughs> we just have to be calculated very carefully. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it works. This type of thing is why I've spent so much time. Yeah. <laughs> Every line is rookie five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 94, 95. Yeah, it's Im impossible to. <laughs> I can't see a clear way to wait. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's 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 very hard to 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 choose when a takes b five and king takes b five, but. This was your first big think of the game, really, uh, Niels, I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I spent some time on Bishop B5 as well, but yeah, this really felt like a critical moment. Uh, yeah, I took with the Queen, it's more positional, but I'm losing some momentum, so maybe it's a bit too slow. Uh, yeah. Queen D6. And, uh, well, I played Knight uh, BD2. Also, very actually, natural. instead of queen d6, I was trying to work on knight b4, but <laughs> yeah, knight before uh, knight, c3. knight c3, I intended, and uh, yeah, and bishop d7, bishop d7, yeah, yeah worst case, I just take an f6, yeah. gf. It's important you have up to rook e5, rook e4, rook e4, yeah, because yeah. otherwise, I'm just wanting to something, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, rook e4, and you made me, <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's very hard, oh. to... okay, the evaluation was not so impressed, <laughs> not so impressed, yeah, it looks super scary. Did you look at this, David? Yeah, uh, I looked at this. I mean, originally my intention was at least to bluff with my b4, but then it just looked scary. I mean, yeah, it's. Uh, Maybe I, actually, I can take a c4 and just run rook e8. To be honest, I, I wasn't actually calculating this super carefully. I just thought by feeling it must be not working for black. Ah, but, uh, but uh, not bishop t7. No, uh, not bishop t7 here because bishop f6. Uh, oh, wait. Bishop this is what you just said there. <laughs> Oh, yeah, that's what we thought. Oh, okay. yeah, it's yeah, too complicated. Yeah. <laughs> so, Queen D6, I think. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, night before, yeah, it's, you should only play it if you can get very, very carefully. But Queen D6? Uh, 92. 92 also makes a lot of sense. Bishop D7. Yeah. 
I guess I should go to B1. I mean, I didn't really. It looks most natural. I mean, I, I can go to B1 and to go 94 and take with the coup. That is very strange. In B3? No, yeah, yeah, yeah. So Bishop A7, and here I had my uh, my longest think of the game. I had a, a couple of uh, very concrete options, but which one is. is which, better? which other moves did you look at here, Niels? I mean, I looked at my E5, for instance. Again, wasn't entirely clear what happens in something like this to me, but uh, felt it feels very scary for black. But I wasn't uh, wasn't entirely sure. The idea is knight c3 here yeah, for black and white displays knight f3. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. And so... yeah, and it'll end up with two bishops for a rook. Black has a couple of pawns, but feels like the pieces are better than the rooks. Yeah, the pieces are very active here. And uh, well, I looked a lot, uh, of course, <laughs> about what happened in the game. Yes. And okay, I was also considering some slower moves, like let's say a move like bishop b5 or something, just playing um, positionally, like uh, mm. trying to claim that the structure is slightly better because a5, b7, but it looked very, very little to me. It didn't look like enough. So, mm. But um, my feeling was that I have something very good here. I just couldn't, uh, couldn't really. I even looked at very strange things like this. <laughs> <laughs> or knight e5 or knight g5 d4 but this, d4 is hanging and it's not so i need one more move uh, i mean to sacrifice a few of the, of the pawns uh yeah, Niels, do you think do you think in hindsight that maybe a takes b5 was a was a more testing move for black maybe but it yeah it's not impossible but also it depends on this specific position i guess i still feel that i might have uh have something here but mm. but what uh, <laughs> i mean <laughs> it's very hard to, <laughs> to say yeah Rook e5 is a move, but again, bishop takes d4, I wasn't sure. Looked like it. Uh, <laughs> it's so messy, everything is hanging. But even without. Also, bishop c6, yeah. It's not so clear what I'm uh, what I'm gaining. Yeah, the rook and e5 looks very pretty. But... Yeah, it doesn't do that much. It gets in the way of the knight. So... Yeah. Mm. No, maybe knight e5 is the, is the critical I mean, Knight e5 move. was what I was scared of. And... Yes, I think Malcolm Payne was saying about knight e5 here, maybe. Probably yeah, yeah. This moment. yeah. Yeah, I mean, if if not bishop takes d4, like something like bishop e6, then knight e3, and knight e3, and d4. Well, I have slight, uh, slightly more active pieces and slightly better structure. Yeah. Uh, maybe not so much. Yeah. Nothing special. There's no direct threats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for white anymore. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, in yeah, the game, yeah. it's very concrete. But... This is very forcing. Yeah, what we did. Had you yeah. seen this coming, David? Yeah, um, I'd actually, yeah, I'd worked it out when I played kind of c6, c takes b5. Wow. Yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. Excellent. It's nothing else to think about for 40 minutes. Yeah, um, so I guess, yeah, it's possible to take, uh, take back as well. But bishop c6, bishop c6 and uh, just slowly, because it's not so clear maybe what is your next move. Yeah, maybe. Maybe actually, I, I spent most of my time calculating the forcing stuff, but maybe uh, something a little bit slower like this. Yeah, it's tricky for me to get my rooks. Actually, yeah, what what move are you are you making here? Um, I don't know whether to pick in h6 or not, but maybe just rook ace. I don't know, because h6 I might play b7, huh? It's very... Uh, okay. it's maybe quite... rook ac8 is more useful. I don't know if this... I mean, here, right? Can... Here, maybe you can just take everything. Um, rook ace. Yeah, it feels a bit scary. Feels scary, but... What rook h? No, <laughs> rook h4, maybe. yeah, try to mate, or I don't know. And ninety five is there in some yeah. some version as well. It feels uh, like white should white may have something, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But this is the thing. I was looking all the time, uh, like felt to me very promising, but I couldn't find anything. Actually, what about just rook e five? Not so possible. Mm -hmm. If the knight moves, I have bishop e seven. Not so easy to kill. Maybe not given that battle. A5 then a5 is yeah. and then d4 is it's hard to say but it feels promising i mean what i did it simply doesn't lead anywhere so uh <laughs> yeah, i wasn't sure queen f6 or queen f4 but maybe no big difference probably no big difference uh, queen f6 felt more compact maybe. a bit more <laughs> compact yeah and yeah this is just uh bishop. maybe we should see yeah yeah but it's a bit, it's a bit uh it's a bit strange no yeah. like <laughs> why not take d4 yeah, yeah. Did yeah. you guys see anything, Stuart? Um, no, no. Well, we, I mean, this came quite fast now, and we, we felt yeah. uh, that you had it under control now, David. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I'm, I mean, I'm just in time with Bishop C. I was 
wasn't actually entirely sure how bad this was. Uh, let me see. Yeah. Not, not here. Maybe, so. not next, but next move, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah, yeah, here. Rook takes f7. This is what we expected. And then the exchange down at the end with bishop takes a4. Right? Well, and I, I wasn't sure about this. And anymore. it must just must be a draw somehow, right? I guess it's a draw, but I thought it can also be a little bit uh, dangerous for that, but probably it's just a draw. And I can go for some attack. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, maybe. something like this. I just thought, why risk it? Yeah. Why yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. But okay, yeah. I never know those positions, even with the rook one set. Probably it's still a bit Yeah, it depends yeah, where, so how fast are the kings and so on. I, I was trying to figure it out. But... Yeah, actually, there's a cunning trap right after rook. <laughs> rook takes uh, f7. Yeah, uh... yeah. Rook takes f7. Because otherwise, if you have to go for f3, it's just an immediate draw. Yeah, 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 exactly. Seven, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rook e8 check and... And then bishop takes f2, I just uh, move the king. Yeah. Oh, I see. Wait, I didn't see that. That's nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah I just move it and I pick up the Yeah, exchange. so you need the rook. <laughs> you need the rook off you one minute. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Mm. Otherwise, the rook is hanging. So, <laughs> but okay. for a minute or so, I was <laughs> slightly tempted until I saw rook e8. <laughs> but, you know. but yeah, okay. And this, uh, I basically, I thought I'm slightly better now because, okay, very little, but uh, I have the e file. The king is perhaps slightly vulnerable. Uh, and I just missed this idea of uh, trapping my rook. Tell us about bishop b2, David. Tell us about that move. Yeah, so I guess I saw it coming when I played rook b8, and I got a bit excited for a while. Just I mean, the rook on a2 looks so silly, and at the very minimum, I gain a few moves just my c4 and all my rook's active. So I was getting mm -hmm. very optimistic. Yeah, because it. you threatened queen f7, right? Yeah, exactly. Who threatens queen f7? Uh, yeah, queen f7 somewhere in the center. Yeah, and also actually around here, I had maybe a minute or two more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's of course it uh, like with two three minutes to get surprised by B two B two is very unpleasant, of course. <laughs> Suddenly, I have to calculate some lines in order not to lose. Right, instant. right, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a scary move for white, but also yeah, first time in the game. The head of the clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Momentum wise, I thought maybe a big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Nils defended quite well, I thought. Yeah, this okay. Rook before and now just. I mm. think this is good enough. Yeah, I couldn't see it. I mean, if black has one extra move with rook b8 and h, then maybe it's a bit. Then it's very dangerous. Yeah, probably. Scary for white. But the problem is my black, uh, my king, the target for the white knight. Yeah, yeah. No yeah. time for queen f7, get onto that diagonal. Yeah, yeah I mean, so. probably, probably it's simply okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, again, I'm not sure if you guys saw anything. Uh, well, we didn't know. We we um, we we ran about here. We predicted some of the moves actually. Uh, Queen c2, rook b4, h3. We more or less um, mm -hmm. thought that they would come, and either h6 there or rook f8. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Take take. Uh, not queen b3. No, I played knight d2. Knight d2. Yeah. Because. Yeah, knight yeah, d1 loses to queen e6, right? Yeah. 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 Exactly. <laughs> When you were reaching for the knight, I was thinking, oh, come on. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah. now, yeah, I'm threatening knight b3, and so it looks like yeah. black is a bit too slow. Yeah, knight b3 is maybe even the bigger threat than knight c4. In some lines. Yeah, I couldn't really. Yeah, so I, I just decided, okay, enough is enough, queen c3, and <laughs> just make it wrong. Yeah. yeah, it looked like a good practical choice, queen c3. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, king. King f1. Yeah, because. It's time to see five, six, four, maybe still some chances. That moves, but yeah, the king f1 is, yeah, king f1 is nice. C5, king c4, yeah. Uh, black should probably take on d2. Uh, if the knight comes to c4, it's quite dangerous. Yeah. Like, uh, so it's just wrong. Yeah, yeah, maybe I should take d2 as a slightly better version of the game. Uh, <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it's uh, not but... going to make a big difference. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. yeah. No, interesting, a very, very sharp game. Yeah, and yeah. it was quite double edged. Yeah, hopefully, you enjoyed it as well. Steve. Yeah, <laughs> we did enjoy that. I'm sure, uh, I know Askil enjoyed it. Pontus came on the show as well. It was very yeah, nice. Pontus also came. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Probably stressful for us to play, but. Yeah. <laughs> how does it feel? Just tell me, uh, just briefly, how does it feel playing in such a splendid venue? It must be, it must feel quite special to be there. Yeah, yeah it's very nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I mean, the people are so friendly there. And, yeah, I mean, first time I've been in any embassy, let alone. <laughs> <laughs> Such a nice place in London. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, it's great. It's great. Day or two, I think we were a bit <laughs> intimidated. It was just around and so. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, now, I mean, now it's going to be tough to get 
of used to playing in dingy school halls well. and going back to the normal, <laughs> normal uh, routine. So yeah, it's a, one of the best venues I've played in. Fantastic, yeah. So last round tomorrow, Niels. Last last chance tomorrow to last well. Come back, yes. Definitely. Yeah, come back. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we'll try and uh, put on a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Is this the first time you both played a ma match of this or like ten game match? I mean, it's not that common that you get to play matches, is it? The first time anybody plays apart from the World Championship <laughs> for a long while, yeah. yeah. I guess these matches used to be normal years and years ago, but yeah, this this. This century, I don't know. Yeah, it's, since it's, since I started playing chess, I don't think there has been any in game match. Uh, I mean, apart from the World Championship, right? Yeah. The London Chess Classic, there are, there have been six game finals, and in Prague and a few other places, they hold. Mm. Teams, but exactly. Now six seems to be the, the number. But yeah. Ten is a lot. <laughs> we had the super long time control. Yeah, yeah. Class, so it's, it's been a it's been a slog. It looks like you managed to stay best of friends, and uh, yeah, I can see you're both. Uh, you know, I mean. Yeah, I mean, this is after all not the world championship match. I mean, we are <laughs> we are really trying to beat each other over the board, but uh, mm. also trying to you know stay friends also after the match. Yeah. Yeah. So far, we have been quite successful. So far, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one more, one yeah. more uh, chance to destroy it all tomorrow. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, maybe this this match will set a new trend. Uh, maybe other organizers and sponsors will be looking at this match and saying, "Hey, this is nice, Jess. It's interesting. It's exciting. Good for the people watching." You don't and need maybe that much space, mm -hmm. that many people around. Mm -hmm. Only two players. Very easy to organize. Yeah, mm. it's easier than yeah. big tournaments, I guess. And yeah. actually, just before I left Norway to come to England to play this match, uh, Magnus said Magnus was just laughing. He was like, "Oh, it's the match nobody knew they wanted to see." But. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's no uh, fair play to the sponsors and yeah. uh, organizers. It's been great. It's been great. Uh, yeah, hopefully, catch fun. Brilliant. Well, listen, good luck, guys, for tomorrow. I hope it's a fantastic yeah. game of chess and uh, yeah. hope to see you uh, very soon. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Just do it. I see yeah, you. Thanks. Just coming. Thank you. I'll see you. Okay. All right, that's good. Hey, great to get some insight from from the players. What's next? Yeah, brilliant. And, and uh, uh, yeah, another day, another game. Uh, mm. One game left of this uh, match here in London. Um, last chance for Nils to to fight back and, and get a draw. It'll be nice to see uh, if David plays relatively solid. Let's say tomorrow and. Yeah. Uh, if he also, uh, or if if Niels provokes him somehow in the opening, maybe to sort of play uh, more uh, something aggressive and uh, you know, absolutely, uh, maybe tempting for David to, to just be solid with White, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, you never know. And may maybe Niels has a has an ace up his sleeve in terms of some. Well, it's kind of a must-win, uh, isn't it, situation for the match? Some interesting opening ideas, maybe mm -hmm. he, he has mm -hmm. saved for tomorrow, so that will be definitely mm -hmm. interesting. And uh, yeah, tomorrow I will be joined by a young uh, Norwegian international master, Tuil Fredrik Kosten. So looking forward to that. And and thank you so much, Stuart. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you for asking me. It's been a pleasure uh, to be on the show uh, and to. Uh, you're you're a legend. Time. So this has been, uh, ah, been come on. absolutely ah. uh, brilliant <laughs> and uh, good to catching up with you in here in London. And yeah. absolutely. Well, thank you very much, and thanks also to Malcolm and to everyone connected with the match and to the players. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, uh, uh, maybe I'll see you at the uh, Mamma Mia musical. <laughs> yeah, tomorrow. Looking, looking forward to it. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I'll be back tomorrow with uh, Tour Frederick, uh, same time, uh, three o'clock CET. So, uh, yeah, see you then and uh, take care. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone, welcome to our new video series. My name is Jan Gustafsson and I'm thrilled to be reunited with fellow Magnus Carlsen's trainers, seconds, Peter Heine Nielsen, Magnus Carlsen's head coach and Laurent Fressinet, Magnus Carlsen's French coach, are both here and we will be going through the World Championship match 2021. Our experiences with it, the games, what we prepared, where we felt things went well, where we felt things didn't go well. 
Peter, we have different perspectives because we were in different locations. Very much. I'm looking forward to talking to you guys about it because you were in Thailand during all the match and I was in Dubai with the Magnus and the Theology. It's non-chess team. So I see some kind of debriefing where we will discuss what was the mood in Dubai, what was happening in the technical department in Thailand. And we got to sort of basically compare notes and uh, yeah, get the two kind of inside looks uh, from the match. Very much so. And Laurent, we are actually in your private home. Thanks for having us. It's a big pleasure to, to welcome both of you. And I'm sure it will be interesting to talk to you guys about the match. Likewise. So we hope you guys enjoy the series with our behind-the-scenes insights. <laughs> See you then. <laughs>